that the other man does not see. Ah. Am I saying the same thing twice there, or is there a little difference? Mm -hmm. One man is wiser than another. He's superior. No, no, wise than because he sees what is before or after what the other man sees, or because he sees it before and after that the other man does not see him. <coughs> there are quite other things. You, you said before that you can, you can see a distinction without seeing the before and after. So he, yeah. he might yeah. see yeah. It's so what is before, but he might not see the before and after. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me exemplify the two. That's a very simple example. Huh? The first philosopher, Thales, huh, said that water is the beginning of all things. Okay? So he saw nothing before water, right? Okay. Now, if Lavoisier discovered that before water is what? Hydrogen then Lavoisier seems to be wiser, right? See? The one man saw nothing before water. Huh? Mm -hmm. The other guy saw that, ah, oh, something before that, right? Okay. Or take another example, right? Huh? <clears throat> Sometimes you want to do something, but you don't see the consequence of what we're going to do. <laughs> or maybe we see, you know, the consequence of what we're going to do, but not the consequence of the consequence. Mm. <laughs> And uh, the uh, more prudent man, right? He can see the what? Consequence of your action, right? Okay. And therefore he's what? Wiser. Why is it right in this matter, huh? Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned how um, when I was in graduate school there, the uh, logic professor came in and he had that text from Thomas's commentary on metaphysics and he was distinguishing between what the private road or the special way of proceeding in each science and the common road right and common road is before the private road you know? he didn't see anything before that right and when Sr. Dion came in and distinguished the three right yeah. <laughs> so um, the one man didn't see any road before the road of logic right common road, and the other man saw the natural road, right, before that, right? So he seems wiser, right, huh? Okay. Um, now, what's the difference between that and the second part now, huh? Well, let's take a simple example from English fiction here. Uh, John Dryden, who became a poet laureate of England, right? He describes how, as a young man, there were more plays of Beaumont and Fletcher performed than plays by Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And now I don't think you hardly ever see a play by Beaumont and Fletcher. I don't ever remember reading one. Mm -hmm. I read a few of their plays in the books, but I've never seen them on the stage of you. Okay. But there were more plays of Beaumont and Fletcher performed than by Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. Especially Fletcher. So he saw the plays of Fletcher, he saw the plays of Shakespeare, right? And as these years went by, he began to realize, hey, but Shakespeare is much better, right? He began to realize, as he said, that Fletcher was just a limb of Shakespeare, <laughs> an arm or a leg, right? Huh? Okay. So notice, when he was seeing Fletcher and Shakespeare in the early part of his life, right? Um, he had seen both, right? Heard both, right? But he didn't see right away that the plays of Shakespeare were better than the plays of what? Fletcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? You see the difference between that and, and Thetis who sees nothing before, right? It's not that, that um, um, it's, it's like if someone had, had uh, uh, had some knowledge of water and had some knowledge of hydrogen, we didn't realize that water was what? H2O, right? Mm. Okay. He sees what's before water, but he doesn't see it as before water. 
Do you see that? Okay. Suppose I was here with one of my sons, huh? and uh, you see us as two different individuals. You don't realize that I came before him, as, <laughs> right? You know. I could know two individuals without knowing which one is what. Older, for example, right? Huh? And I always talk to so and so. You know, you get me. Yeah, talking, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Some people look look their age. Some people <laughs> look younger than their age, right? And so on. And I always thought that so and so was older than so and so, and then all of a sudden you you find out, right? <laughs> See. <clears throat> so it's not like you are ignorant of who was before and who was after, but you're ignorant of their what of their order, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have somebody who, who can tell the difference between wine and beer, but doesn't know wine is better than beer. <laughs> 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 <Right>. <laughs> or someone who can recognize Mozart and, and Haydn, but doesn't know Mozart is better than Haydn, right? See? Okay. So sometimes one man sees what is before or after the other man sees, right? And so um, in that case, he's going to maybe eventually see that the before and after the other man doesn't see, right? But sometimes somebody sees both, but doesn't see that one comes before the other, right? In one of those senses, right? right? But I look at you people here, I'm maybe not altogether sure, you know. Are you before him in time, or, or, or you know? So I'm not you know, altogether sure about that, right? <laughs> right? See, in most couples that I know, the, the man is older than the woman, right? <clears throat> but I know a few marriages where the woman is a year or so older than the man, right? Mm. You know, it should be that way, but I mean, it is sometimes. <laughs> I know some marriages of this sort, right? So, but I can certainly know a couple. And, and distinguish the husband and the wife, right? Without seeing that which one is older, right? Especially when, uh, you know, doesn't look their age, right? So, let, let's say the wife is older than the husband, she's before him, right? Mm. I see what is before, but I don't know that it is before, right? In time, right? Mm. Okay, take a less controversial example than the one about the wine and the beer. <laughs> you see what I mean? <clears throat> um, see the difference, right? Mm -hmm. But in a sense, I write the statement to. Shakespeare's definition of reason, right? So reason is the ability for a large discourse looking before and after, right? So if one man succeeds in seeing something before after what the other man sees, mm -hmm. you know, if there are quarks before protons, I don't know. <laughs> then the man who sees the quarks might be, you know, mm -hmm. wise in that sense, right? You could distinguish between maybe the ocean and the, and the moon, right? Without knowing if it's true that the moon causes the tides or something, right? So it's not so repeating, it, it looks like that at first, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> seeing the various senses of these words, right? <clears throat> a man might know the various senses of the word to see, right? <clears throat> but not see that the word 
I mean, the act of the eye comes first, and then to imagine it comes second, right? And then to uh, understand, right? You know, when I ask students in class, sometimes I'll say, um, you know, what it means that we're to see, <clears throat> and the only means I'll usually talk about is what you know, to see the eye, and then they'll, they'll put the second one to understand, right? <clears throat> well, because those means are so far apart, it's easy to to see they're different, right? Mm. But they would sometimes, you know, speak of seeing up in the sense of imagination, right? But they haven't ordered the meanings yet, right? Mm. You see. So I think when a man sees that the first meaning of to see is the act of the eye, the second is to imagine, and the third is to understand, right? Then he sees it before and after, among meanings that someone else might not see, right? Mm. Okay. Nowadays, you hear people talking all the time about you know, establishing your priorities. That's kind of a you know fashionable word now. But prior is what the Latin word for what? Before. Before. Yeah. 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 So, what does it mean to establish your priorities? What does that mean? To order things according to the importance. Okay. But is it only that? You see. No, some things that are unimportant, but they need to be done anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in one sense it means the better things, right? Huh? But sometimes you have to do the the more necessary things first, right? I say to students, for example, <clears throat> um, which is better, to breathe or to philosophize? That's one of my favorite questions. I know they're going to say to breathe, right? Okay. And I say, now why do you say to breathe is better than to philosophize? Else. Yeah, yeah. And I say, well, that's the reason you're giving there, right? You're saying you can't do anything else in life if you're not breathing, right? That shows that breathing is before philosophizing. In what sense is it before? Second. Second sense, right? Which is, you, this can be without that, but not vice versa, right? You can breathe without philosophizing, but you cannot philosophize without breathing. That shows that breathing is before philosophizing. In being, <coughs> doesn't show it's better. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. See? Before. See? And then we show later on that the in is what's better, right? Mm. And uh, is breathing your purpose in life? No, you can only do it for so long. <laughs> <laughs> but you breathe so you can do other things, right? <laughs> like eat or something, right? <coughs> so that it's not the best thing in life, right? If you're confusing the second and the fourth sense, right? Aristotle says, um, is the opposite of the worst the best? No. No, it's saying the corruption of the best is the worst. Well, let's say, uh, which is worse, to kill a, a man or kill a dog? To kill a man. Yeah. And that, therefore, you could argue that a man must be better than a what? Dog. Dog, right? Okay. Now, what's the exception to that? Well, that that's generally true, right? Which is worse, to be mistaken about who won the game or to be mistaken about God? Mistaken about God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So therefore, knowledge of God must be better than knowledge of who won the ball game, right? Okay. There's any exception to the rule that the, the the better is the opposite of the worse. And the Wait, you that, say it again? Yeah. I, I, is it that the opposite of the worst, right? Is, is is best, right? Or the opposite of the worst is better. Is there is there an exception to that? Hmm. 
What would be worse for me now, to stop philosophizing or stop breathing? Stop breathing. Yeah, yeah. But that's because breathing is before philosophizing in the second sense, right? Mm-hmm. Right? So if um, A is before B in the second sense of before, right? Then the loss of A is worse than the loss of what? Oh, B. B. Even though B is better than A. So if I stop breathing, I'll stop philosophizing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and everything else I do, right? Mm-hmm. See? But yet breathing is not better than philosophizing, huh? I breathe for the sake of philosophizing and doing other things, right? Which are more my hinder goal or purpose in life, right? Mm-hmm. When I was a little kid, they used to ask him to eat to live or live to eat, right? And there were some <laughs> questions about the way some people live, right? Mm-hmm. With eat to live or live to eat, right? But even those days, no one, you know, asked you, do you, you know, breathe to live or do you live to breathe? <laughs> it's pretty clear that you breathe to live, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, so, when A is before B in the second sense, right, it is necessarily true then that what? That the loss of A will be worse than the loss of B, right? But A will not be better than what? B, huh? Okay. You see that? See, that's why you get very careful with the, with the the second and the fourth sense, right? See, you notice where the student is arguing, right? He's arguing. I, I give him the choice, right? I say, question: Is it better to breathe or to philosophize? Huh? And I know they're going to answer to breathe, right? Mm-hmm. Okay? But then you ask them to defend that answer, right? Mm-hmm. Why is breathing better than philosophizing? Well, if you're not breathing, you won't be philosophizing everything else, right? So they're arguing that because to stop breathing, right, is going to be worse than to stop philosophizing. <laughs> Therefore, breathing must be better than philosophizing, right? Mm-hmm. See? Now, if there was not that before and after of the second sense, Then you could argue, you know, that the loss of this is worse, right? Therefore, it must this must be better. I'll give another example here, the, the, the word but less controversial for the student. I say, I say um, which is better, to live or to live well? But notice, to live is before living well in the second sense, isn't it? You can live without living well, but you can't live well without living, right? So which is worse, to not live well or to not live? <laughs> or is to not live. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's life, there's hope, as they say. <laughs> See, so to... to to stop living, to die, is worse than to not live well. But living well is better, nevertheless, than, than just living, right? In the sense of, of the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, that's the exception to the rule that the opposite of the worse is, is better, right? Yeah. Aristotle says about wisdom, right? He says, every other knowledge is more necessary than wisdom. But none is better. <laughs> so he sees the distinction there between the necessary and the better, right? Mm-hmm. That's what this hinges on. Right? Yeah, say yeah. I say, when I say to the students, you know, um, I say, which is better, to breathe or philosophize and say to breathe, right? And then I ask them for the reason. And I, and I point out to them that their reason shows that breathing is before philosophizing in the second sense of before. Not in the fourth sense, see? But you can say in the defense that uh, if two things don't have a before and after in the second sense, right, then the one whose loss is worse is what? 
perras. Give, give, give a theological example here, right? <clears throat> Which is better, um, charity or faith? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, which is worse, the loss of charity or the loss of faith? Loss of charity. No. Faith. See, if you lose faith, you can't, have you can't have hope or charity. See, so the loss of faith is worse, right? See, uh, than the loss of charity. Mm. But charity is better than faith, right? Mm. See, there's, there's an order among them, right? Uh, the same way with, with, with hope there. <coughs> hope is, is in between. Uh, hope is, is better than faith, but um, faith is more necessary, right? Mm. And the loss of faith would involve the loss of hope and charity. Okay. So you, see, you can't argue from the fact that the loss of faith is worse to faith being better. That's a mistake, you know? Um, so what was the, the, the original? You were phrasing a, a question originally. Well, so, uh, well the students, I, I asked them, which is better, right. to, to breathe or to philosophize, right? There was, yeah. there was, there was something you said in before that. In, in before you started giving examples, you were just giving a simple... Then we would plug in these different, different examples, like breathing and philosophizing. Mm -hmm. Is the worst the, the opposite, opposite of the good? Is the worst necessarily yeah. the opposite of the best? Yeah. That was the thing. Oh, how to plug these in? I'm trying to plug them in. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm trying to. Mm -hmm. like, I, I said, you know, you know, you know would, would you rather, so if you had to choose, would you rather be blind or deaf? You don't want either one, but if you had to either be blind or deaf, well, would you? That would be deaf. Deaf, yeah. See. So if, if to be deaf is not as bad as to be blind, then seeing is better than what? Yeah. yeah. See? But notice, there's no order of the second kind between seeing and hearing. It's not that you can see without hearing, but not vice versa. Or, no, there's no order of that sort between the two, right? So if the loss of hearing is not as bad as the loss of sight, then sight must be better than, than hearing, right? I'm still thinking that is the worst the opposite of the best. So the worst is not always Better. the opposite of the best. Well, I, I'm saying that so the if there's not an order of the second kind, right, mm -hmm. then the opposite of the worst is best. Huh? The opposite of the worst is, is better, right? Mm -hmm. Right. See? When Aristotle distinguishes the three kinds of government there, you know, the, the good and the bad, and you have monarchy, uh, excuse me, monarchy, aristocracy, the republic, and then the, the bad ones, democracy, oligarchy, and, and tyranny. Well, tyranny is the worst, monarchy is the best. <laughs> democracy is the least bad, and republic is the least good. <laughs> See? Um, so this is kind of a common rule, right? Which is um, uh, which is worse? Um, we call it the virgin and the vices, right? Huh? Some vices worse than others. Hmm? Yeah. And then the virtues they're opposed to then must have what? Yeah, yeah. Which is which is worse? Let's say injustice or, or stinginess. Injustice. Yeah. So therefore, justice must be a greater virtue than uh, liberality or generosity, huh? Right. right. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's a good a good r rule, huh? Yeah. But, but the exception, you know, and, and, it's, and it's a very important exception, is that though when 
this is before that in being, right? Then the loss of it is going to be worse, right? Even though it is not better than the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but you can't even think about these things well without knowing those senses of before, right? The first thing I, I do is accuse students of, of equivocation, right? Because they're arguing that the breathing is before in the second sense, right? I say, I say which is better? I said, a uh, pile of bricks or a brick wall? Why, why do you pay more for a brick wall or a brick house than a pile of bricks? <laughs> is it worth more? Huh? Right? Because in the, well, you, but in the case, it's... Uh, yeah, it's yeah. You're going you're gonna to pay more for a brick pat, patio than a pile of bricks, right? Yeah. You know? So brick... And, and the bricks are for the sake of the brick patio or for the sake of the brick wall, right? So the end is always better than when it's for the sake of it, no? Okay? But you can have bricks without a brick wall. You can't have a brick wall without bricks. See? So let's restate that thing. So... The opposite is the word. Uh, the opposite of the worse is better. That's the stated rule. But the exception is in sense number two. Yeah, where, where you have that order. Yeah. And yeah. This is yeah. before that yeah. being. Yeah. And the loss of yeah. worse. Yeah. You, you find this strange thing in Thomas, you know, where, where infidelity is in a sense the worst of sins, right? So why, why not, you know, despair or, you know, the vice opposed to charity and so on? Huh? You say, well. You lose faith, you lose hope, and charity, right? Mm -hmm. You see? You know? There's this an exception to the exception. Hmm? Uh -oh. When our Lord said it would be better for him if he wasn't born, it seems to be saying it would be better for him not to live than to live. Mm -hmm. Only because of the eternal misery. So that's the opposite of living well. Yeah. Eternal misery. So. Yes, eternal misery would be one reason. Yeah. For not yeah. To live. yeah. <laughs> I think about that a little bit more, you know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's with someone like Judas, though. You know, you know, Judas. Um, uh, he despaired, right? No? Judas of. Uh, of uh, forgiveness, right? His spirit, right? See, why, why Peter, the, you know, did his, obviously, his, you know, his awful thing as, as, as he did, right? He didn't despair of being, what? Forgiven, forgiven right, for his, his denial of Christ, right? You know? So isn't despair worse than uh, hatred of God, right? <laughs> in some sense, huh? Or envy of God or something of that sort, right? Pride, you know? Right? You're kind of cut off, right? You know? Regarding the things that you've been handing out to us, yeah. I wanted to, first of all, emailing you at your email address would be fun. What does the word? Anything to 
right? Yeah, it's probably the best way to translate it into English. Premium, paving the way, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Timaeus gives a premium to his discourse on the universe in the dialogue called the Timaeus. And almost every work of Aristotle's has a premium to it. But Thomas, when he writes a commentary on Aristotle's works, he'll not only explain Aristotle's premium, but he'll give a premium himself. Mm-hmm. Like we had the premium here to the Nicomachean Ethics. Huh? Now usually Thomas's premium you know, stands back a little bit further from the work than Aristotle's does. He's kind of situating it in the whole of our knowledge or in you know, take a little wider perspective. Huh? Now, <clears throat> there are only two works of Aristotle's in logic that Thomas wrote a commentary on. And one is the Peri Hermeneus, which he didn't complete his commentary on. Cajetan completed it. And then he wrote a commentary on the posterior analytics. So the first of these two premiums is taken from the beginning of his commentary on the Peri Hermeneus, and the second one from the beginning of his commentary on the posterior analytics. But the second one is much broader and, and deeper than the, the first one. Huh? Okay? So, um, let's look at the beginning here of the major premium. Huh? He says, as Aristotle says in the beginning of the metaphysics, the human race lives by art and reasonings. And we saw that in the premium to the uh, wisdom. In which the philosopher, no, Thomas very often refers to Aristotle as the philosopher. And that's a what? Yeah, antonomasia, right? Okay. He often refers, refers to St. Paul as the apostle. Peter and Paul are called the apostle by antonomasia. Okay. So you'll see sometimes he use the word Aristotle or the name Aristotle, sometimes philosopher. So he says, in which the philosopher seems to touch upon a certain property of man by which he differs from the other animals. For other animals are led by some natural instinct to their acts. Man, however, is directed by the judgment of reason in his acts. And hence it is that diverse arts serve to perfect human acts easily and orderly. Now he gives a kind of common notion of art. As Monsignor Dion would point out, the word art in Latin and the word techne in Greek, they first refer to these practical arts, huh? these mechanical arts that transform matter in some way, like the art of carpentry that made this table, or the art of metalworking that made this chair, huh? and the art of the glass blower or whoever made this glass. Huh? Okay. But Thomas here is taking art in a broader sense. Huh? And this is, what's this broad sense of art that he takes here? It says an ordering of reason by which the acts can reach determinate ends through simple means. Yeah, yeah, okay. And this sense, this broad sense of the word art is going to apply even to logic, right? Okay. So when I was coming up here, I was using the art of driving an automobile. And the reason has figured out how to use your hands and your eyes and your feet to drive an automobile, right? Okay? And I can do it in an orderly way now <laughs> and easily, right? In fact, sometimes I'm hardly aware of the fact that I do it from here to there because I'm thinking of <laughs> something else, but I do it, you know, almost habitually now. Okay? Now, in the second paragraph, he makes a very interesting distinction, though. He says, in all the other arts, reason is directing the acts of some other part of man than reason. Like, in my example there, the hands and the feet, right? Mm. And in a sense, the carpenter and the plumber and the metal worker and so on, they know how to use their hands and sometimes their feet, too, huh? to make things, right? And their eyes and so on, huh? What's unique about logic is that reason is going to be directing 
not the acts of the hand or the feet or some other part of man, but the acts of reason itself. Okay? And how is that possible? See? What's possible because reason can not only think about the hand and how to use it to play the piano, wherever it might be, but reason can also think about what? Reason. Thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, in some way, uh, knows its own act, huh? comes back upon itself. Huh? Okay? And that's why the famous words of the seven wise men of Greece, the Nopi Sautan, know thyself, huh? they could be applied to reason in particular. Because reason is the only part of man that can know itself. The hand doesn't know what a hand is. The hand doesn't ask what a hand is and how a hand differs from a foot. But reason asks not only what a hand is, but what reason itself is. And you'll see that reflected in certain interesting things in logic that you talk about, for example, definition in logic. Not only can you define, say, square like you do in geometry, or define man as we did earlier, but reason can even define definition. There's a definition of definition. And there are statements, we'll see, about statements. And there is reasoning about what? Reasoning, right? And that reflects the idea that reason can come back upon itself. Huh? Okay. So that's what he points out in the second paragraph. Reason, however, is not only able to direct our lesser parts, but also directs its own act. For this is a property of the understanding part, that it reflects upon itself, which means comes back upon itself. For the understanding understands itself, and likewise reason is able to reason about its own act. If, therefore, from this, that reason reasons about the act of the hand, there has been found the art of building, let's say, or metal working, through which man is able to perform acts of these kinds easily and orderly. For the same reason, some art is necessary which directs the act of reason itself, by which man can proceed in the very act of reason, orderly, easily, and without error. And notice he's been using the words orderly and easily, right? And now he adds the word without air, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now if you think back upon uh, the art of carpentry or the art of plumbing or the art of cooking, right? Then, the person who possesses this art, they go about doing something in an orderly way, don't they? Mm -hmm. And they can do it much more easily than we can, right? Mm -hmm. And they avoid the mistakes that the neophyte, the beginner, makes all the time, huh? Okay. So if something goes wrong with the plumbing, right? You can try to fix it yourself. But you don't know exactly what to do first or what to do second. You try this, you try that, right? And you have, you know, difficulty, right? And you make certain mistakes, you know, that have to be rectified, huh? See? I sometimes do a little carpeting down in the basement there, you know, and my brother-in-law, who was a professional carpenter, he says, what did you do that for, Dwayne? You know, you should have done this. And done, that. <laughs> done that, see? And it's kind of interesting to see the way the, the carpenter, the plumber, he, he right away he comes in, he does things in a what, one, two, three way. Mm -hmm. In the same way the cook, right? Mm -hmm. Cook does things in an orderly way and with ease and without air, right? And perhaps the order there is interesting. Orderly first, huh? Because if you see, you know what to do first, second, third, it becomes kind of what? Easy, right? Huh? And then you also tend to avoid errors because you're proceeding in an orderly way. Okay. And so he says, this art that's going to direct the acts of reason is called logic, an art which is named from reason itself. Huh? Logos, right? Okay. And he says, it's named from reason in a special way. Every art is something of reason that reason has figured out, right? But what's peculiar to this art is that it's also about reason or about the acts of reason. And therefore he calls it the what? art of arts, huh? right? Because it directs reason in its own act, and all of the other arts, the hands or the feet or the eyes, are being directed by what? Reason. By reason, right? But here reason is directing itself. Huh? Therefore it has a right to be called the art of arts, right? It directs the director, you might say. <laughs> all the rest. 
And here you see a likeness of, of logic to what? To wisdom, right? Okay. The art of arts. Huh? Okay, now in the fourth paragraph here, next to the bottom there, paragraph, he's going to now divide logic, right? Okay. And you'll find out that most arts or sciences, most wholes, in fact, are divided usually into two or, what, three parts. Huh? We'll talk about that rule of two or three, but we saw it in theology a lot, right? Uh, geometry, for example, is divided into two parts. Geometry as a whole. Plain geometry and what? Solid, Solid geometry, right? So the first six books of Euclid there are plain geometry that you get the solid geometry later on. And even those first six books, you wouldn't divide them into six books. You divide them into the rectilineal books, the first two books, the circular books, the third and fourth book, and the proportional books, five and six. Huh? Okay. So they tend to fall into two or three. When you get into uh, natural philosophy, huh? The basic division there is into two parts, a general consideration of change and then the particular consideration of change. And the particular consideration of change is divided into three parts, huh? change of place, change of quality, and growth. Huh? And that's the origin of physics, chemistry, and biology originally, though most people have forgotten the original reason for it. So they get kind of confused now about it, but it was back to that. Huh? Uh, theology is divided into how many parts? It can be divided into um, three parts. Yeah. Consider God in himself, right? Then God is the what maker, right? And the Lord. And then God is the end and the provident one, right? So you consider God in himself, God is the beginning of other things, and God is the end of all things. Like in, in so was it Psalm uh, 18, now know what the Lord is God, he made us, his we are, his people the flock he tends. That's the three parts. <laughs> know the three parts of theology. <laughs> You're being said or told in that psalm, right? Yeah. Know that the Lord is God, huh? he made us, his we are, his people, the flock he tends. Huh? Yeah. You consider God in himself, God is a maker, and God in his providence. Huh? And then the three on natural philosophy and its place following. Well, no, in philosophy, natural philosophy, you divide it into two. Right. Consideration of change in general, and in particular. then in particular, mm -hmm. but the division in particular right. is into three. Right. Change of place, change of quality, and change of quantity in the sense of growth. Yeah. Growth. Okay. And say that's the basis of the division we still use in high school and college into physics, chemistry, and biology. Because physics was originally a study of change of place, huh? chemistry of quality and substance, and then uh, biology, the study of things that grow. Okay? But that tradition, that division became customary, and people forgot the reason for it. Huh? Okay? And so. Um, really something like atomic physics belongs with chemistry, not with uh, mechanics. Huh? So if you look at Heisenberg's division, the gift for lectures, he puts atomic physics with chemistry, right? Okay. But the, so the original base of that was place, two kinds of change. Huh? Okay. Now, um, uh, Thomas divides Aristotle's logical works, and therefore logic itself, into what? Three parts, right? According to three acts of reason huh, that come in a certain order. Huh? And you could say more precisely that these are three acts of looking reason. Huh? Okay? And the first act is going to be presupposed to the second and the second to the third. Huh? Now you can name these acts in various ways. I like to name the first act as <coughs> understanding what a thing is. 
Okay. So understanding what a triangle is, right? Understanding what a man is, right? Understanding what reason is. Huh? Understanding what a dog is, right? Understanding what a stone is. This is the first act of reason. Huh? And the second act, I call understanding the true or the false. And this involves putting together in an affirmative statement or separating in a negative statement the things you've understood by the first act. So if I understand in some way what a man is, and they understand in some way what and they understand what a stone is, I might separate them in a negative statement and say, man is not a stone, right? And then I'd be understanding something what true, right? I could un also understand the false opposed to that, right? Man is not an animal. Or a man is a stone, right? And, okay. So you can see how this first act is presupposed to the second time. If I didn't understand in some way what a man is, and I didn't understand in some way what a stone is, I wouldn't understand the true statement that man is not a what? Stone, right? Okay. Now the third act huh, presupposes the second act. If you understand at least two statements that are what? might be true, might be false, right? You can put them together sometimes and reason out, or reason to, in another statement. And this is the third act now, which could be called reasoning. Okay. Now, Thomas is going to mention other names of these acts, some of them, but this is the way I usually name the three acts, right? Okay. So if I understand the statement that uh, every mother is a what? Woman, right? And I understand that no man is a woman. I could reason with those two statements, right? To the conclusion that no man is a mother, right? Okay. Or if I understood that no animal is a stone, huh? and every man is an animal, I could reason to no man is a what? Stone, right? And so this obviously presupposes huh, at least a couple of statements in which you reason. Huh? So that's the third act, right? Huh? Now in both premia here, he will distinguish these same three acts. Look at the premium there from in the Perihermeneus. <clears throat> It goes back to what Aristotle talks about in the third book on the soul, where he talks about these first two acts. Huh? As the philosopher says in the third book on the soul, the operation of the understanding is twofold. Huh? He calls these first two acts both a kind of understanding, right? And the third he calls reasoning. One which is called the understanding of indivisibles, huh? Understanding, in other words, man or animal or stone rather than man is an animal, <laughs> which is a complex or composed thing. By which the understanding grasps the nature of each thing in itself. Huh? So sometimes they call this first act simple grasping. Huh? <laughs> but grasping is another word almost for understanding. Huh? Okay. But it's a very suggestive word. I can't grasp the center of this table. Why not? I can grasp this glass because I can separate the glass from the air around it. But I can't grasp the center of this table because I can't separate the center of this table here from the rest of the table. I took out my saw and sawed out that piece. Then I could grasp it, right? Mm -hmm. and you see that's important in grasping what something is. You have to be able to separate it from everything else. Huh? Okay. So it's an interesting word, huh? that we borrow the word for the what? Act of the hand, grasping, and then we apply it to the mind. Huh? Okay. In 
And the other, he says, is the operation of the understanding, putting together and dividing. Huh? Here he's thinking now of an affirmative statement or a negative statement, right? And the affirmative statement you put together, like say man and animal, and say man is an animal, right? And the negative statement, the way you separate things, you say man is not a what? Stone, right? So Thomas usually refers to that second act as, the way Aristotle speaks of it in the third book on the soul, putting together or separating, right? Okay. I like to call it understanding the truth or false because the words putting together and separating have other meanings besides this, right? But this here means it very accurately understanding the truth or false. And then there's added, however, a third operation of reasoning by which reason proceeds from the known to an investigation of the unknown. And that's very characteristic of reasoning. Huh? And that's later on, look at that text of Aristotle where he talks about that in the premium to the posterior analytics. Okay. Let's go on to the second paragraph there in the Peri Hermeneus. He says, the first of these operations is ordered to the second because there cannot be a putting together and division except as simple as grasp. Huh? Unless I've grasped in some way what a man is, right? Unless I've understood in some way what a man is. And I've grasped also in some way what an animal is, right? And understood in some way what a animal is. Unless I've done that first, I couldn't really, what? Put them together and understand what it means to say man is a what? Animal, right? Okay. If I tell my students that a perfect number is a composite number, they don't understand that very much. That they don't know what a perfect number is, right? Maybe they don't even know some of them what a composite number is, right? See? So I'd have to grasp I'd have to understand what a composite number is and what a perfect number is, and then I could see that a perfect number is a composite number. Okay? Um, so that first act, in a way, is ordered to the second act. The second, however, is ordered to the third because it is necessary that from some known truth to which the understanding is sent, one proceeds to getting certitude about something unknown. And as Thomas says more explicitly elsewhere, you need at least two statements, right? In order to get a what? Third statement. Huh? Just like in calculating to add, subtract, multiply, or divide, you need at least two numbers mm -hmm. to get a third number. Huh? Mm -hmm. okay. Since, he says, however, logic is called the science of reason, it is necessary that its consideration be about those things which pertain to the aforesaid three operations of reason. And now he divides Aristotle's books, but not as completely as he does in the commentary on the Postanalytics. Aristotle therefore determines in the book of the categories about those things which pertain to the first operation of the understanding. That is about those things which are conceived by a simple understanding. So that's the first book in logic that's come down to us from Aristotle. If you get the so-called basic books of Aristotle, like in Random House, or the one that McKeon edited, right? The very first group of books are gathered together. They're called the organon, right? And organon is a Greek word, or we get our word organ, by the way. Huh? Organon is simply the Greek word for tool, okay? And logic is called the tool of philosophy. Huh? So they put Aristotle's uh, logical works together with the title Organon, meaning the tool. And the first book you'd see in the basic works of Aristotle would be a book called The Categories. And that pertains to the logic of the first act. Huh? Okay. The second book you'd find is this book called the Peri Hermeneus. translated Latin, de interpretation. So it's really about the statement. <laughs> uh, that corresponds to the second act, right? Okay. Now all the rest of the books that Aristotle wrote in logic 
that gave him the title of the father of logic are dealing with the third act, right? Mm -hmm. But Thomas doesn't subdivide those books in the premium to the perihermeneus because he's going to explain the perihermeneus, right? Mm -hmm. So he just goes so far as to separate these three, right? But in the Posture Analytics, he's explaining one of the books down here, so he subdivides these, right? And so we'll be looking at that subdivision a moment then. But the first book in this third group is called The Prior Analytics. Huh? And the books following that, as Thomas says, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And they all pertain to the art of what? Reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So there's many more books devoted to the third act there than to the first and the second act then. Okay? And we'll meet the subdivision of those other works, huh? Okay. The philosopher determines about those things which pertain to the second operation, namely about affirmative and negative statements in the book called Perihimenaeus. He determines about those things which pertain to the third operation, the book of the Paralytics, and the books following it, which are taken out the syllogism simply in the diverse species of syllogism argument. And therefore, by the foresaid order of the three operations, the book of the categories is ordered to the book of Perihimenaeus, which is ordered to the book of the Paralytics and the ones following it. Okay? Is that clear enough? Okay. Now, let's go over to the major premium here, which is going to go more into the third act. So, he says, towards next to the bottom paragraph of the first page of the premium, it is necessary, therefore, to take the parts of logic according to the diversity of the acts of reason. There are, however, three acts of reason of which the first two are reason according as it is a certain understanding. <laughs> so I borrowed the word understanding for the first two acts. Huh? A one act of understanding, he says, is the understanding of the indivisible or the incomplex by which it conceives what a thing is. Huh? Notice the word conceive there is taken from the woman, right? Huh? Okay. And concept, right? And you may have uh, know that Socrates' uh, mother was a midwife. And so Socrates described himself as an intellectual midwife. Okay. And this operation is called by some the forming of the understanding or imagination through the understanding. Okay? Now, you don't want to confuse imagining with thinking or the image with the thought, but there's a certain likeness between them. When I imagine something, I can do so in the absence of the object, right? So in order to imagine something that's absent, I have to form an image of that. Well, thinking is like that, huh? I can think about something in its absence. But when I think about it, I have to do something like the imagination does. I have to form a thought of it. Okay? And that's very important later on when you try to understand the Trinity, right? Okay? And we sometimes, you know, start with our own mind to kind of approach and understand the Trinity. Huh? Well, if our reason understood itself, right? There would proceed from our reason a thought about what reason is. Huh? And so when God understands himself, there proceeds from God a thought, right? Of what God is, right? But since in God, to be and to understand are the same thing, <laughs> that thought is God. Okay, in the beginning was the word, right? Okay. So there's some comparison here, huh? See, when I see you, you have to be present for me to see you. I can't see if you're not here, right? See? But if I remember you and I go home tonight, right? Then my seeing can't go to you because you're not there. But I form a what? An image of you in my memory, right? See, in my imagination. I picture you again, right? Okay? 
And we'll come back to that because that's going to be very important, I think, in seeing what logic is about. We're going to look again at the premium to come in ethics for a big hint here. Now, page three here. The second operation of understanding is the composition or division of the understanding. Now, again, he uses those words there which have more than one meaning in, in logic and elsewhere, but to refer to what reason does when it makes a affirmative statement, right? Mm -hmm. And what it does when it makes a negative statement. See? And when I say man is an animal, I'm as we're putting together man and animal. Mm -hmm. He calls that composition, following Aristotle there, right? Mm -hmm. And when I s separate man and stone, I say man is not a stone. It's like I'm separating the two, right? Mm -hmm. Dividing the two, right? Okay. So Thomas usually calls that second act, following Aristotle in the third book on the soul, composition or division. But you could also call it understanding the true or the false. Huh? Okay. And for this act of reason, and, and this, yeah, and for this act of reason, serves the teaching which Aristotle gives in the book, the Perihermeneus. Now, the third act of reason is according to that which is characteristic of reason. And we saw in Shakespeare that, what? Reason is the ability for discourse, right? And discourse is coming to know what you don't know and what you do know. So this is what see to characterize reason, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so he says the third act of reason is according to that which is characteristic of reason, namely to go from one thing to another, so that through what is known it might come to a knowledge of the unknown. And sometimes you'll find the medieval magicians calling that third act discursus, <laughs> almost like a synonym for reasoning. Okay? And the rest of the books of logic that have come down to us in Aristotle serve this act. Huh? Okay? But now, in the rest of, of this, the next, this page, the next page, Thomas is going to subdivide, right, the books in this third, what? Act right now, huh? and he's commenting on one of them, the postulatics. But how does that fit in among all the other books there are? Right? Okay. Now, basically, into how many parts does Thomas divide the books of the third act? Huh? Three. Into three. Huh? Yeah. Again, the rule of two or three there, right? Huh? But if you read Plato's dialogue, the Phaedon, and if you ever had a chance to read the Phaedon, uh, but in the Phaedo, the longest philosophical conversation is about the immortality of the human soul, right? And Socrates gives about three arguments in favor of the immortality of the human soul. And everybody there seems to be more or less satisfied with the three arguments of Socrates except Simeas and Sibes, uh, who are kind of, you know, whispering to each other there in the corner. And Socrates says, are you still thinking about, you know, the question, or are you going on to something else, right? And they say, we're still thinking about it. Well, well share with us your, your thoughts, right? And then Simeas comes in with an objection to something Socrates has said, to the arguments of Socrates. And Sibes comes in with another objection to one of Socrates' arguments. And all of a sudden, the arguments of Socrates that seemed good to just about everybody there no longer seem to be any good. And they fall into a kind of what? Despair. Despair, right? Huh? And uh, the young man to whom Phaedo is narrating these things, right? Has that same sinking feeling you know, that they had, right? How are we going to trust these arguments, right? Well, Socrates did something Phaedo says, I never admired him more for. He leads them out of his despair, right? But he makes a very interesting comparison. He says, you might end up being a hater of arguments because you trusted an argument you shouldn't trust, right? But maybe you shouldn't blame the arguments, right? Maybe you should blame yourself for not knowing the difference between a good and a bad argument. And among good arguments between one that is necessary and one that's only probable, right? And uh, in order to make this uh, more known, Socrates goes back and talks about how someone becomes a misanthrope 
a hater of mankind. And he points out that men start to hate others because they trust somebody who lets them down, right? So the woman marries a no good bum, right? And she begins to what? Hate men, right? Okay. And um, uh, most people can see there's something mistaken about hating everybody. And that you ought to have some smarts in order to tell the difference between those you should trust and those you shouldn't, right? But Socrates goes on and he says, there's really three kinds of men. There are very few men you can trust completely. Men who are never let you down will stick with you no matter what happens. There are some men you can't let trust at all. Most men are in between. You can trust them up to a point, but not completely. Okay? And Socrates is pointing out what is obvious to most people from their experience that there are these three, right? Okay? In the same way, um, with uh, with uh, women and men, right? Huh? There's some, you know, uh, man you can trust a woman with completely, like, like John Paul II. That's it. <laughs> okay? Some men you can't trust a woman with at all, like, like Don Giovanni. You wouldn't trust your wife, your daughter, with Don Giovanni at all, right? Or Casanova, or one of these guys, right? Most men in between, you can trust them up to a certain point, but you've got to know how far you can trust a man, right? Uh-huh. And uh, a woman would be kind of naive if she didn't know this, right? Uh, the priest that uh, officiated at our wedding. Um, he was on the marriage tribunal for a long time here in, in uh, Worcester. He's dead now, but he was on the tribunal a long time. And uh, some of these cases are so ridiculous, right? He could help and say, you know, why in the hell did you marry her in the first place? You know, you should have seen him with a no good, you know, bum, you know. I mean, some, you know, most women have more smarts than that, right? Mm-hmm. So Socrates is saying, uh, if you can't distinguish between the person you can trust completely, the person you can't trust at all, the person you can trust up to a certain point, uh, you got to trust someone you shouldn't trust, or trust somebody more than you should, you'll be let down, and then you will begin to what? Hate men. See, it all no good. Huh? Shakespeare had that famous play, Timon of Athens. Huh? Timon of Athens was a famous uh, misanthrope of ancient times that Plutarch talks about. And in the play, uh, Tim is very generous and he has people at the dinner all the time he gives them little presents when they come and so on he's got all kinds of friends but then when he falls into what, financial need he thinks he can, you know, obviously borrow some money because he has all kinds of friends and they keep on putting him off, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but even his stewards knew that they were just, what? using him, right? They were fair with their friends and so on huh? so in a sense, Tim could blame himself, right? Or not knowing who a true friend is and so on. So Socrates says, don't blame arguments as if no arguments are trustworthy, but arguments are like people. There are few arguments you can trust, but completely. There are some arguments you can't trust at all. Most arguments are in between. They can be trusted up to a point, some more and some less, right? But not completely. And Socrates says, we need an art about arguments. Huh? And that is, to my knowledge, the first time that someone has explicitly said, we need the art that we now call, what, logic. Huh? What's interesting in that comparison between the two is that he's going to anticipate the very way that we divide Aristotle's books about arguments. Because the prior in the posterior analytics these first two books that Thomas is going to talk about, the prior and the posterior analytics are about arguments you can trust completely. And these arguments are called demonstrations in um, logic, huh? from the Latin word. Huh? The Greek word is apodexis, but it has the same root, right? And uh, comes in the word to show. The old license plate there from Missouri. I'm from Missouri, you've got to show me. <laughs> okay. But you'll notice in, in, as you go through Euclid huh, that at the end it'll say QED, which is kind of the Latin for what was to be demonstrated. 
Okay? So the primary question analytics are about arguments you can trust completely. Uh, the book called Sophistical Refutations are about arguments you can't trust at all. Okay? Simply bad arguments, huh? Now the books in between that Thomas is going to subdivide huh, are about the arguments you can trust up to a point, right? But not completely. Okay. Now, arguments that produce something like opinion or suspicion, right? But not um, certitude like this, these do here. Okay. And so Aristotle or Thomas will mention the books there. The topics is the main way to translate in English, and then the the rhetoric and even the what, poetics to a certain extent. Huh? Okay. Well, sometimes they don't put rhetoric and poetics and logic in the strict sense, but in the broad way Tom's looking at it, he includes that, right? Okay. We'll say a few more th words about these when we get there. Okay. So these arguments produce um, something like opinion or suspicion. We use opinion more for this and suspicion down here for rhetoric. <laughs> but they're really, you might say, uh, ways of making a what? Reasonable guess, right? Okay, we'll talk about those more particularly as we go on these different texts. But in the third paragraph here, Thomas goes back to a fundamental thing here. Reason imitates nature, right? So far as possible. And you have the same thing in nature, huh? There's some things that nature produces always and necessarily, like the rising of the sun, it seems, huh? Other things it produces most of the time, but not always, like a healthy human baby or something, right? But sometimes nature what fails and produces something bad, right? Huh? Okay. So he compares reason in that respect to nature huh? and that these three are also found in the acts of reason for there in the fourth paragraph for there is a proceeding of reason bringing a necessity in which a defect of truth is not possible and through such a proceeding of reason is acquired the certitude of knowledge huh? there is another however proceeding of reason in which the true is for the most part concluded not, however, having necessity. And the third proceeding of reason is that in which reason departs from the true because of the defect of some principle that should have been observed in reasoning. Okay? Now, why are the two books devoted to this first part? Right? Well, in order to be sure of the conclusion, two things are necessary. One is that the conclusion follows necessarily from the other statements. And the other is that the other statements are necessarily true. So, in the Paranalytics, huh, he teaches us how to take apart this kind of an argument that we call demonstration to see if the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. In the posterior analytics, he shows you how to examine the premises to see if they have what's required to be necessarily true. Okay? So those two things are necessary. And it's a bit like calculating in that respect, right? To be sure the number I get by adding, I have to what? Add correctly, right? And I have to have the correct numbers to add. So if I get the wrong number in my checkbook, right, as often happens, I go back and I check it over, and I see that I didn't add or correct or, or subtract correctly, right? That's one kind of mistake. Or maybe I wrote the number in, <laughs> wrong decimal point or something, right? Or my 7 didn't look like a 7, it looked like a 1 or something. And I had the wrong number, right? Okay. 
So the demonstration has those two things to be considered in, right? And that's why you have the two books, the prior and the posterior <laughs> analytics, huh? So he says, the part of logic which serves the first proceeding, the demonstration, is called the judging part, in that judgment is with the certitude of knowledge. And because a certain judgment cannot be had about effects except by resolving the first principles, therefore this part is called analytic, that is resolving or taking apart. Huh? The certitude of judgment, however, which is had by resolution, is either from the very form of the syllogism only, and that's referring now to whether the conclusion follows the premises necessarily. And to this is ordered the book of the Paramedics, or also with this from the matter, because per se and necessary propositions are taken. And to this is ordered the book of the Posterior Analytics, which is about the demonstrative syllogism. Okay. Now the second part here, where you have arguments now that are not uh, giving a pseudotude, but they might, you might say they give you what you might call a, a reasonable guess, right? Okay. But the reasonable guess here is stronger. You might call it opinion, right? And the reasonable guess here weaker. You might call it suspicion. Okay. So the book called the topics, huh? and the book called the rhetoric, insofar as it deals with what one kind of argument, right? Is dealing with these arguments that don't produce complete certainty. So we're going to uh, talk about those kinds of arguments when you get down to that text from Aristotle there in the beginning of the posture analytics. Okay? So I won't go into any detail about those arguments right now. But he puts the poetics in there too because sometimes a man reaches a conclusion by what? Representation. Representation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, Uncle Tom's cabin, I guess, was what? Persuade a lot of people against what slavery, right? Huh? Okay. Um, give you a little interesting example of this, huh? I have two brothers, right? And when we were living in the same house every twenty over twenty years, next door they had one son. His name was Kenneth. Huh? Well, Kenneth's mother died. Huh? Okay, and Kenneth's father remarried, right? Okay, and so we were told about this, you know, and that he's going to have a stepmother now, right? Well, my mother overheard us talking at the table how we're going to protect Kenneth from the stepmother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, where do you get this bad idea that stepmothers are cruel and they never even met them, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you see? In the fairy tales, right, the stepmother, <laughs> as opposed to the natural mother, right, they treat the child very bad. Right? <laughs> Stepmother's up. You see? So my mother quickly, you know, stop it, didn't do it, you know, <laughs> and explain to us, right? And uh, if anybody needed protection, it was, it was the stepmother from Kenneth, because Kenneth was kind of a joker, joker, joker. And he'd go to the window, you know, and yell, Help! No, stop me! <laughs> and the mother would get, you know, it's embarrassed because she tried to do everything right, of course. Yeah. Being the you know. And she was the nicest woman in the whole neighborhood, really, you know. We really loved her, you know. But, <laughs> but that's an example, I mean, you see. We're influenced by the way these things are presented, huh? You know? Uh, Warren Rather wrote a book, Are We Movie Made? You know, how young people get the idea of how they should act, you know. They're persuaded to act this way from the way it's represented in the. The movies, huh? They're kind of dangerous in that sense. Um, so, let's look at the way Thomas separates these here. Another part of logic, which is called the finding part, serves the second proceeding of reason. For finding is not always with certitude. Another word you could use there is guessing, right? Guessing is not always with certitude, right? But a reasonable guess is more apt to be so than not. Whence judgment is required about those things which have been found in order that certitude may be had. Moreover, just as in natural things which are done for the most part, a certain gradation can be noted, because the stronger the power of nature, the more rarely it fails in effect. 
So also in the proceeding of reason, which is not with complete certitude, some gradation is found as it approaches more and less to perfect certitude. For sometimes, though a process of this kind, although knowledge in the strict sense, meaning something certain, does not come to be, nevertheless belief or opinion comes to be because of the probability of the propositions which it proceeds. For reason wholly turns to one part of a contradiction, although with fear of the other, and to this is ordered the topical or dialectical. For the dialectical syllogism is from probable opinions, which Aristotle considers in the book for the topics. Huh? And Aristotle defines a probable opinion as the opinion of all men or most men or the most famous men in some art or science. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sometimes belief or opinion does not come to be completely, but a suspicion. Because reason does not wholly turn to one part of a contradiction, although it is more inclined to this part than to that. And to this is ordered the arguments considered in the rhetoric. Huh? Okay. Now Aristotle, when he takes up rhetoric, there is a book called The Rhetoric. He points out that rhetoric is really an offshoot of logic, in a way an offshoot of dialectic, and an offshoot of political philosophy. Because rhetoric is the art of persuasion, and you persuade people not only by the arguments you give, but also by the image you project of yourself and by the way you move their emotions and prejudices. Huh? And so political philosophy, ethics and so on, they help rhetoric in that regard to project in the right image, right? Mm -hmm. And they study the emotions and rhetoric makes use of emotions. So it's kind of an offshoot of political studies and ethical studies, but also of logic, right? So we don't classify sometimes the book of the rhetoric simply as purely logic, right? Aristotle uses that word in Greek there. And the Greek word is parafouez. He says the rhetoric is a parafouez, which could be translated as an offshoot. Okay? It's not um, simply or purely a part of logic, right? It's an offshoot of some part of logic. These are some kind of arguments, right? And it's an offshoot of ethical or political studies. Okay. If you go back to Thomas's um, distinction of the four orders, right, in the commentary to the uh, premium to Nicomachean ethics, it's an offshoot of the second and the what? Third. Huh? You remember the order that reason considers does not make? Then the order the region considers in its own acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The order considers in the voluntary acts and then the exterior matter. What's well, an offshoot of the second and the what third? Mm -hmm. uh, modern experimental science is an offshoot of the first and the fourth. It's a union of natural science and technical science, as Heisenberg says in his gift for lectures, right? That's why the oldest part of modern science is called physics and in particular. Mechanics. Physics comes from the Greek word for nature, and mechanics comes from the mechanical arts that Thomas talks about. So it's an option of the two. Huh? It involves a kind of union of natural and technical science. Huh? So um, modern experimental science is not a purely natural science. And rhetoric is not a purely what, logical science. Huh? That's why that division is very interesting, you know, to understand rhetoric and modern science, because they're not, they don't come purely into one of those four, right? But they involve, what, taking something from a couple of them, right? Um, I kind of suspect that, that modern mathematical logic is not purely what? The art of calculation or the art of logic. It takes something from both, but it's not the same as either one, huh? It's interesting now that rhetoric dominated the ancient world huh, after its invention. And even the great Christians like St. Ambrose and St. Augustine were very much into the art of rhetoric. Huh? Christ is supposed to have appeared, you know, to um, Jerome and said, Are you a Christian or a Ciceronian? Huh? Hmm. And, uh, uh, but the modern world is dominated by the other offshoot. 
empirical science. Huh? It's one of the factors of fluency in the modern world. Okay. And the point of course, is even less purely a part of logic. Huh? Okay. So if you look at, at the, what they call the organ down there, the basic works, you have the prior and the posterior analytics, the topics, and then the system refutations. And the rhetoric and poetics are put separately, right? Thomas is looking at this in a very broad way, so in a broad sense we can say that <coughs> rhetoric and poetics has something to do with leading people to conclusions. Okay. So sometimes belief or opinion does not come to be completely but a suspicion, because reason does not wholly turn to one part of a contradiction. It definitely is so, or it definitely is not so, right? But it's more inclined to one than the other. Sometimes only evaluation inclines to some part of a contradiction because of some representation. In the way in which detesting of some food comes to a man, if it is represented to him under the likeness of something detestable. And to this is ordered the poetics, for it belongs to the poet to lead it to something virtuous through a suitable representation. Did you ever read uh, the Illustrissime there by John I Paul I. You know, it's written in the form of what? Letters to famous men, right? And someone's appropriate to write about, uh, to who, to about some particular matter. Well, anyway, he writes about the music or the uh, film festival, I guess it was, in Europe, to Goethe, huh, the German poet. Huh? And he's talking about how a work of art should be moral from what? Intrinsically from the beginning to the end. Huh? And it shouldn't be something you know, attached on to the end. What is an immoral play, right? And he's writing it to Goethe, because Goethe wrote the, what? Das. Sorrows of Young Werther, which led to suicides all over Europe. Um. He began to realize his responsibility in a way, right? Mm. It's a story of hopeless lovers and so on, and other people saw themselves in this place, so they um, commit suicide like the mm. actors in the play, right? Mm. And uh, so it's appropriate that he writes to him about it. Huh? Mm. But he says... Um, he gives the example of Oedipus Rex, right? And he says, a marvelous understatement though, but perfect example. He says, after reading or seeing Oedipus Rex, one is hardly enthusiastic about incest. <laughs> you know, the play, right? It's a perfect example, huh? Of what he's saying. Okay. So all of these, he say, in some sense pertain to reasonable philosophy or rational philosophy for it belongs to reason to lead from one thing to another end. Okay. Now the part of logic which is called sophistic serves the third procedure of reason, which Aristotle considers in the book of the sophistical refutations. Huh? Okay. So in the prior and posterior analytics, you're considering an argument by which reason is led necessarily to a certain conclusion, right? In the topics, in the rhetoric, and so on, the poetics, where reason is not led with necessity, but with probability, or at least suspicion, or kind of an estimation it is so. But here you're going to be led astray, right? But the magician studies these things to avoid being deceived and to avoid being led astray. <coughs> so any question about this, this is very... Uh, rhetoric is an offshoot of, of, of from dialectic, huh, which is, yeah. And we'll see that when we get to the that text of Aristotle. In, in uh, dialectic, you have the syllogism and induction, the dialectical syllogism and induction. You have something like the syllogism in rhetoric, the enthymy, something like induction, the argument called example. But we'll see the details that when we get to it. Huh? But it's also an offshoot of, of that end of ethical and political studies. Because as a speaker, I want to make it appear as if I'm a knowledgeable man, right? Mm. And I, I'm your friend, you know? I have your good in mind, you know? And of course, I have to talk in a way that's appropriate to what? My audience, huh? Mm. And if you go back and read uh, Demosthenes' speeches, one of the speeches there, he's making fun of the opponent. Because he scrubbed benches when he was young. I, I said to myself, that'd be very bad rhetoric today, right? <laughs> See? But the fact that this man scrubbed benches when he was young meant that he's a nobody in that Greek society, right? He doesn't come from a noble family. Huh? 
See, so this is more aristocratic huh? mm -hmm. custom, see. But today it would be exactly the wrong rhetoric because we're democratic, huh? And we admire the self made man and the man who's born wealth we don't admire so much, right? It's almost, you know, science of music for attacking him that he was born with you know, gold spoon in his mouth or whatever they say. Mm -hmm. see? But if a guy came up, you know, the hard way, right? And scrub benches and did menial things and worked his way up, then we what? Yeah, see. see. <laughs> so you have to know the different kinds of government, right, which belongs to political philosophy and their customs of those ones, and then you can be more persuasive, huh? Okay. And of course, you know, you go around and you you know you talk to different groups, you're talking to businessmen and you're talking maybe to labor union people, you don't talk the same way, you know. And some people make a business of going around and recording the guy's speech to each group, you know, to see how it changes, huh? Okay. But um, the it's ethics and political philosophy that studies customs and different kinds of government and the virtues and the vices, right? And so you're trying to, you know, appear to be a man who's your friend, right? I used to say about the two politicians in my home state there, uh, Hubert Humphrey, right, who was senator and went for president one time, and uh, Freeman who was governor, right? Humphrey really did like people. He was a friendly guy. Freeman didn't read like people, but <laughs> outwardly he was <laughs> friendly, right? So, so you have to project a certain image of yourself, right? And you want to project an image of someone who's what? Knowledgeable, right? Huh? Someone who's careful, someone who has your good in mind, right? And these are things, qualities that are studied in ethics and political philosophy. So the art of persuasion takes in emotions and then the art that you get them. If you want to see a beautiful example of the art of rhetoric there in the work, it's when Iago persuades Othello that his wife is unfaithful. There's absolutely no real basis for that at all, right? But uh, Iago projects the image of himself as he's really uh, the friend of Othello, right? He projects the image of a man who, who's very observant and sees into people, right? But a man who doesn't state his what suspicions lightly. Mm -hmm. So you have every reason to trust this man, right? Mm -hmm. Here's a man who, who's really your friend, right? Mm -hmm. A man who, who understands people much better than you do, right? A man who is very hesitant, you know, to state what he his suspicions, right? To have some basis for it. You're already disposed to believe this man when he starts, right? Mm -hmm. but then he starts to work on the emotions. Mm -hmm. He starts to rouse the jealousy of what a fellow. Then, as he says in one of his soliloquies, to a man who's in this state of mind now, this jealousy, even a flimsy proof will seem like sacred scripture to him. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the proof he gives, the handkerchief of here, is a very weak argument, right? Of infidelity, but it's very convincing. That's all he needs, right? Mm -hmm. To a man who's already, you know, moved to jealousy, huh? So sometimes we don't consider rhetoric a part of logic but an offshoot of one part of logic and an offshoot of ethical and political studies. Huh? Aristotle talks about that, right? In the, uh, 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 the book called the rhetoric, right? Okay. <coughs> but in the broad sense, you can say it as something of the aspect of argument, right? And therefore, Tom's looking at it in a very broad way. We'll include that. And even the poetics, right? Which is a study of the imitative arts, huh? But because men are led to certain conclusions by imitation, right, then you can, in a broad sense, say that pertains to logic. Okay? Okay, now let's look at some of these short texts on logic here. This is page five of your... Now this is taken from Thomas's commentary on Boethius's work on the Trinity. Thomas says, Looking sciences, as is clear in the beginning of the metaphysics, are about things the knowledge of which is sought for its own sake. Huh? So the word looking means trying to see, trying to understand, right? So looking sciences, which are really mathematics and natural philosophy and first philosophy or wisdom, they're pursued for their own sake. Huh? 
This is not true about logic. Okay? The things, however, which logic is about are not sought to be known for themselves, but as a help to the other sciences. Huh? And therefore, logic is not contained under looking philosophy as a principal part, but is something reduced to it. In a way, it's the what tool of looking philosophy and in general philosophy. But now Thomas adds something here that's a little more new to us here. Insofar as it provides looking with its tools, namely syllogisms and definitions and others of this kind which we need in the looking sciences. Once, according to Boethius in his commentary on Porphyry, is not so much a science as a tool of science. Huh? Porphyry wrote a famous book called The Isagoge, The Introduction to Aristotle's Categories. And that became a standard text all the way through the Middle Ages. So Albert the Great has a commentary on it. Huh? Cajetan has a commentary on it. Huh? Boethius has a commentary on it and so on. Okay. Now so Thomas is saying here, that logic is more the tool of philosophy, right? Than a chief part of it, right? But also that logic, in a way, is about tools, right? Okay? Now, how does that compare with the basic thing we've seen up to this point? Huh? Let's go back to the starting point here. We said that logic is about three acts of our reason, right? going to direct or order three acts of our reason. Huh? And those three acts, let's put them on the board again, understanding what a thing is, two, understanding the true or the false, And three, reasoning. Okay. Now, what are these tools he's talking about, like definition and syllogism and other things of this sort, right? Okay. How are they related to these three acts? Well, suppose a student doesn't understand what a perfect number is. How would I help them to understand what a perfect number is? Define. Yeah, yeah. So a perfect number is a number equal, right, to the sum of everything that measures it. So the first perfect number is six. Huh? Six is measured by one, it's measured by two, it's measured by three, but not by four or five. And 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals what? 6. 4 is not a perfect number. It's measured by 1 and by 2, not by 3. And 1 plus 2 doesn't equal 4. Okay. Now, notice so I'm just using examples there to kind of illustrate the definition, right? But it's through the definition that one is able to understand what a perfect number is. Huh? It's a number equal to the sum of everything that measures it. Okay? What's a composite number? Some students don't know what a composite number is. What's a number that's measured not only by the one, but by some other number, right? So four is a composite number, but three is not. Five is not. Okay? And that's what a prime number is, right? A number that's measured only by the one, not by any other number, right? Okay? If you didn't know what blank verse is, I would give you the definition, right? It's unrhymed, dynamic, pentameter. If you didn't understand what an I am is, I would give you the definition. It's two syllables with the accent on the second one. Okay? Um, so definition is a tool, as Thomas says. Hmm? A tool that is necessary often for this first act, right? I can't understand what a perfect number is without the definition of perfect number, right? 
I can't understand what blank verse is without the definition of blank verse. Huh? I can't even understand clearly what a square is without the definition of square, an equilateral at right angle, quadrilateral. Okay? Now, is there a tool corresponding to understanding the true or the false? It's reason to have to make something. Just like here it has to make the definition often to understand what something is. What does it have to make before you can understand the true or the false? Statement. Statement, yeah. 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 Because really, where do you find truth or falsity? So is any truth or falsity in this room outside of us here? Any truth in the ground? Falsity in the ground? I dig in there, my wife wants to plant some things, and you keep on hitting rocks and roots and. <laughs> yeah, just one hole, you know. So you use a hole, maybe you get the rocks like this, you know. You know, you have to about four or five rocks out of one hole, and then she wanted another thing. So I dug there, they had rocks and so on, and then had roots, you know, with the big. You know, much bigger than this, the roots yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I chopped them with the, some of the blunt axe and so on. So um, uh, I never found any piece of truth in the ground. <laughs> I saw them in the ocean and lakes and never ran any truth or falsity there in the water. I walked through the air every day. You know, mm. No truth or falsity there, right? Where do you find truth or falsity? Come to mind. Yeah. But not in the first act here. But because man, true or false. Animal, true or false. Stone, true or false. If I put that in a true or false exam, you wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> But when I put these together in an affirmative and negative statement, I say man is an animal, or man is not an animal, it's either true or false, right? Man is a stone, or man is not a stone, right? Okay. So in order to understand the true or the false, I have to make a statement. So in a way, statement is the second act, what definition is to the first act. Now, what tool corresponds to the third act? Syllogism. Syllogism is the most perfect, but in general you could say an argument, right? Okay? An argument. Okay. And we'll be distinguishing the syllogism and induction, which are the two main kinds of arguments. Huh? And the enthemy and the example are weaker, but I like those two. I know it's, uh, and you make these, yeah? There's a question about the second, but you also say that um, it's uh, the tool for the second part of understanding would be a combination and division, or is it more well, proper to Well, combination is to be in the act, in the act, right? You're either putting things together in your affirmative statement mm -hmm. or separate them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So notice, these are not the same thing, right? Now, sometimes they compare this a little bit to uh, the telescope, let's say, and the microscope, and these things my nose is holding up, right? You see? This is not an act of the eye, is it? This thing here. See? Okay, it's not, it's not a seeing, is it? And a telescope and a microscope are not a seeing either, right? But are they related to see? Yeah. There are things I can see or see better because I have these on, right? And things I can see with a microscope that I can't see without the microscope, right? Mm -hmm. And things at a distance that I can see the telescope that I couldn't see otherwise, right? Okay? So you can see that the, my glasses or the microscope or the telescope are tools that enable us to see some things we couldn't see without them, right? Or to see those things at least better than we can see them without them, right? Know what you got these things on for? <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So, in a way, these are like that, in the sense that they're tools that are necessary to uh, complete or perfect these, what, acts, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, 
you could say that logic is about these tools in a way. Uh, when you say it's about these three acts, you're thinking more about the uh, end or purpose of logic, right? It's to perfect these three acts. Huh? It's to order these three acts. This is what logic is about in the sense of an end or a purpose, right? But these are the tools necessary, right? To perfect and order these acts. Okay? So when I talk about glasses or microscope or telescope, they're for the sake of seeing, right? For the sake of a, an act of the eye, right? Okay. But you can really say the definition and statement and argument are more what the subject of logic is, right? Okay. But you've got to see them as related to the end or purpose, which is to perfect and direct these acts. Now notice that making a statement, as I say, is necessary to understand the true or the false, because you find truth and false in the only end statements. Sometimes I ask those, where is truth, you know? I don't know what to say at first, right? I say, well, in general, it's in the same place that falsity is. <laughs> in statements, right? Okay. Um, but notice, making a statement doesn't tell you whether the statement is true or false, does it? Now sometimes, huh, we know that a statement is true or false through our senses, right? So if you take these two statements, Berkwist is standing now, right? Berkwist is not standing now. Okay. One of those statements is true and the other is false, right? And in this case, how do you know which is true which is false? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now sometimes, you know that a statement is true or false for reason the first act, right? If I define, for example, um, triangle and I define square, I could see that no triangle is a what? Square, right? Or if I define square and I define quadrilateral, I could see that a square is a quadrilateral. So sometimes you know that a statement is true or false through understanding the parts. Sometimes by the senses, sometimes to understand the parts, right? But if you don't see it through your senses, or through understanding the parts, then you have to go to what? Reasoning to decide whether it's true or false. Huh? Okay? So when Euclid says, for example, that uh, the, in a triangle, these three angles will add up to two right angles, always. But even if I know what a triangle is and what right angles are, I don't see that these have to add up to two right angles, do I just by looking at it? So I have to reason it out, right? I have to use the number of what? Arguments, right? Okay. But obviously you must know some statements without having to what? Reason to them. Otherwise you'd have no statements to reason from. <laughs> okay? So they don't either by sense or by understanding the parts of them. Okay? So, it's interesting that logic is called the organon of philosophy, the tool of philosophy, but as Thomas points out here, you could say also that it, in a way it's about the tools, right? The tools for the sake of perfecting those three acts. Tools for the sake of directing or ordering those three acts. Huh? Okay. Now, the original meaning of art, as we said before, is that an art um, is right reason about making, right? But making in the in some kind of matter, right? But then we carry the word art over and apply it to what they call the liberal arts. But there's a kind of making, but it's not in matter, but kind of a mental making. Huh? And this is what Thomas points out here in commenting on Boethius. The seven liberal arts. Now, you know what the seven liberal arts are? They go back to uh, Pythagoras and Plato, right? The seven liberal arts were divided later on in the Middle Ages into the trivium, which was grammar, rhetoric, and logic. They were the distinguished rhetoric and logic. Yeah. 
grammar, rhetoric, logic. And then the quadrivium huh, goes back to Pythagoras, and that was uh, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Okay. Uh, Plato in the uh, Carmides, he talks about the liberal arts, right? Of course, in his time, they were just starting to anticipate logic, right? Rhetoric had been developed a little bit earlier, and men were running around teaching rhetoric, and they were starting to understand grammar, right? Uh, a learned grammarian told me that the Greeks understood their language. They figured it out. They figured out the grammar of the Greek language. But then the Romans came along, and they were too stupid to figure out the grammar of the Latin language. So they imitated the grammar of the Greeks, huh? and that's why they got their cases all screwed up. <laughs> and they had to, you know, tack on whatever was in the Greek, you know, add it on. And then we imitated the Latin grammarians and followed up our understanding of our own native language. You have to admire the Greeks, right? They're the fathers of everything, even of grammar. And then, uh, you know, they developed rhetoric, right? Of course, Cicero said that Aristotle's rhetoric was a golden river, right? Invented the art of rhetoric into the fathers of logic, right? And the more, the more difficult to understand things in logic, the Romans didn't even have a name for it, like syllogism. That's a Greek word. Induction is a Latin word, huh? But the more difficult things, they didn't even have. Enthymeme and syllogism. <laughs> okay. That's where we get the word trivial, right? Because everybody would know the trivial. But it's not trivial. <laughs> in our sense of the word, right? So the seven liberal arts, he says, among other sciences, are called arts as well as sciences, because they not only have knowledge, but some work that is immediately of reason itself, as to construct syllogisms, huh? to make a syllogism or to make a definition or make a statement, right? Logic is about that. And to form speech, to form sentences like in grammar, and then to number and measure, like in arithmetic and geometry, and to form melodies, music, right? And to compute the course of the stars, right? He's touching upon the four parts of the quadrivium, mm -hmm. which go back to the great uh, Pythagoras. Huh? To form speech, of course, you'd take that to mean rhetoric, too. The uh, rhetoric is about giving speeches. But other sciences either do not have a work but knowledge only as divine and natural science, or they have a bodily work as medicine, chemistry, and others of this kind. Whence they cannot be called liberal arts, because acts of this kind belong to man by that part which is not free, namely the bodily part. Huh? Okay. So notice, in those two uh, short texts there, huh, Thomas is pointing out that Logic, like the other, what, liberal arts, right, is in a way uh, an art because it makes something, although it's a more mental making than a making in wood or glass or paper or something like that, right? And that it's, these are in a way tools, right, that reason needs for these acts, right? Now the next two little passages here, huh? And the first one is more complete for our purposes here. Thomas says, just as in exterior acts, one can consider working in the work, huh? the making of a chair and the chair, the making of a house, the building of a house and the house, right? So also in the works of reason, one can consider the act itself a reason, which is to understand either what a thing is or understand the truth or the false, right? Or reasoning, right? Or something constituted by an act of this kind, huh? which in looking reason, first is definition, which corresponds to understanding what a thing is. Statement, which corresponds to understanding the true or the false, right? Composition or division. Huh? And third, syllogism or general argument, huh? okay. which corresponds to what? Reasoning, right? So you could say that logic is about, right, 
three acts of reason, right? But it's about three acts of reason, not so much as its subject, as its end or purpose. Its end or purpose is to perfect these three acts, right? To direct and order these three acts. Okay? But its subject more is the, what, three tools, right? Definition and statement and syllogism, mainly. Argument. Which perfect those three acts, which make them possible, or at least make them more perfect, right? Just direct them, right? Now, um, if you go back to the text here in the Prima de Nicomachean Ethics, huh? when Thomas is dividing order in comparison to reason, let's look at the order in comparison to reason that logic is going to be concerned with. And Thomas says, there is also an order which reason by considering makes in its own act. Huh? As when it orders its thoughts to each other and the signs of thoughts, right in the middle of the page here, and the signs of thoughts which are signifying vocal sounds. Huh? I think there's a very key passage there in Thomas. Huh? Because I think he's bringing out something that is very subtle. Huh? Let me stop and expand on this a bit. Huh? I think this is a kind of a key to see this. If you ask the fundamental question, huh? how do we order our thinking? Broad thinking there to include all these acts. Huh? How do we order our thinking? Mm, words. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to take another step there, right? Okay. I would say first we order our thinking by ordering our thoughts. Okay? Let me make this a little more explicit. How do we order our thinking about things? Okay? Make it more explicit. I want to answer the question by ordering our thoughts about things. out before that thinking and a thought are not the same thing exactly. Just as imagining and an image are not the same thing, right? Okay. But they're very closely tied, right? When we imagine something, we form an image of it, right? When we think about something, we form a thought about it. Okay? And the image in a way is a likeness of something, and the thought of the likeness of something. Right? Okay? So if we could order our thoughts, our thinking would be what? Ordered, right? Mm -hmm. Just like if we order our images, our imagining would be what? Mm -hmm. Ordered. Order. Yeah. And the way when you memorize something, you know, you have the steps there, right? You're ordering your what? Images, right? Okay? And that's why we go back to the beginning, you know, to follow it in order. You try to remember something, right? Sometimes I, you know, get lost in the middle of a passage, I can't remember, I, I go back to the beginning and say it at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And then I remember it, right? It's in the proper order. <clears throat> but notice something about this. Huh? Can you see, hear, smell, taste, or touch thinking? No. Can you even imagine thinking? Can you see, hear, smell, taste a thought? No. Can you imagine a thought? Huh? So, for an animal with reason, whose natural road is from the senses into reason, huh? 
How can you get at these things that you can't sense or imagine? It needs something sensible, right? Okay. And that comes to the third thing, you know, the vocal sounds, huh? Okay. But ask the proper question first. How do we order our thoughts? About things, huh? about things. Well, it's by ordering the words that signify things through thoughts. the words that signify things and thoughts. In words, the original words are not the written words, but the vocal sounds, as he says, right? Okay. So you can say that logic, in a way, is about using words, right? Insofar as they signify things through thoughts, right? To order our thoughts and consequently our what? Thinking. That's very subtle, right? I think that's all implied in what Thomas says here. Huh? There is also an order which reason, this is now in the framework to the Kamakin ethics, there is also an order which reason by considering makes in its own act, in its own thinking, right? As when it orders its thoughts to each other and the signs of thoughts which are signifying vocal sounds. Huh? Okay? But I'm kind of splitting up that second part there, right? One time the apostles asked our Lord, um, teach us how to pray. Huh? Now it's John taught his disciples how to pray, right? Huh? Okay. And what did Christ do? Give them prayer. Yeah, yeah. He taught them what? He gave them some words to use to pray, right? Huh? Okay. I know those words are not the inward prayer, are they? No. But in order to teach us how to pray, he has to use the what? Outward, sensible sounds, right? Huh? So when you teach a little child huh, to pray, right? You teach them the Our Father and say in the Hail Mary, right? Huh? And they will say these words, right? Not fully comprehending them, right? Huh? But they're gradually what? Ordering their what? Desires and their requests to God, right? As they say these words again and again and understand the words better, right? Okay. Uh, I think in the 18th Psalm, is it? Right? He says, Let the words of my mouth, the thought of my heart, find fear before you. It's interesting the way it proceeds, right? Huh? You have to, in a sense, learn the words, but then your thoughts have to what, go along with those words. Huh? You know, the king in Hamlet, you know, he falls down, he starts to pray, right? After the, the scene there where he reenacted the murder, right? And he can't bring himself to repent, right? He's down there saying words, right? To God. But then he says, words without thoughts, near to heaven go. You know, Hammond goes by, he almost is going to kill him, right? But then, see, he's not kill him, he's praying because that's too nice of to go, right? <laughs> he's got to wait until he's drinking and drunk or something, you know, and, and uh, some activity that don't relish of heaven in at all, right? So he had to really revenge, right? This is kind of, you know, Christian in a way. But, um, after Hamlet goes by, then the king rises up, right? And realizes that he's not really what? The inward is not conformed to the words, right? Huh? So he says, words without thoughts near to heaven go, oh, right? Huh? Well, the same way in, in thinking here, though, right? Huh? The words, right? Just as physical sounds wouldn't do anything, right? But insofar as these words signify things through thoughts, right? We can use those words to order our thoughts about things and consequently our thinking about Now, some people, you know, are kind of shocked by that. Huh? And when you examine the definition, say, of, of definition, or the definition of statement, or the definition of syllogism, 
the first word of the definition of all those things is in Greek, logos, right? Okay. Now, the Greek word logos can mean word, it means the spoken word, later on the written word. Logos can also mean speech, right? Now, later on, logos can mean the thought, right? See? When Aristotle uses logos as the genus in the definition of definition or a statement or a syllogism, is using it in the sense of thought or in the sense of of words, word or words, which is words. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at the commentary, if you look at the Parhermeneus, Aristotle makes it crystal clear that he's using logos there to mean the vocal silence, as Thomas says. So Thomas is very concrete there, right? Yeah. So it's kind of a shock to people when they, you tell them that logic is about vocal sounds. <laughs> no. It's kind of shock, right? It seems to be putting logic lower than it should be, right? Huh? Mm-hmm. They want to say logic's about thoughts. Well, in a sense it is, right? It's about thinking, right? But the point is, um, you can't order your thinking without ordering your thoughts, and we need a sensible tool, right? To order our thoughts. And the sensible tool we use to order our thoughts is words insofar as they signify things through thoughts, right? It's only insofar as words signify things through thoughts that they can be used to order our thoughts huh? about things and consequently our thinking. So what's up front is the sensible what? Tool. Which is either a word or a speech, right? Or just say a logic, a name, or a speech. Um, It's kind of a shock. But make another comparison I make sometimes. Uh, Seven sacraments, right? Very important. What's the genus of the seven sacraments? Sign. Sign, yeah. The sign is something, what, sensible, right? Thomas always goes back to Augustine's definition of sign as that which you know, strikes the senses and brings to mind something else, right? Now, if you say that the seven sacraments are seven sensible signs, that seems to, to lower the dignity of the sacraments, right? You know, Instead of saying that the seven sacraments are seven graces, <laughs> no, you're saying they're seven signs, right? But there are seven signs instituted by Christ to give grace and so on, right? You know. But that's the genus of sign. And and God is what? Condescending to an animal with reason, right? It has to be led from the sensible to what is above the sensible, right? Okay. You see the idea? Okay. Um you know, sometimes in these contemporary catechisms, you know, or whatever you want to call catechisms, but they'll want to, you know, speak of the sacraments as an encounter with Christ, right? Was that really the genus of mm-hmm. the sacrament? Like, yeah, you do encounter Christ in the sacraments, and, and that's why they're so important, right? But the sacrament itself is not an encounter with Christ. It's a sensible sign through which you're going to encounter Christ or the power of Christ, right? See the idea? So, I, you know, sometimes I find people are kind of shocked, right? Yeah, sure. I said, had, you know, you know, someone heated discussion with people about this, right? Mm-hmm. But Aristotle makes it crystal clear that very is yes. that logos is a focal sound. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in a way, the two fundamental definitions of logic are the definition of name and the definition of speech. Okay? The definition of name and of speech and logic are the same in most of their parts. 
but one part is different in each. Okay? So a name is, first of all, a sound. Okay? And a speech is, first of all, a sound. Okay? That's the fundamental word, it's a sound. Now, it's a sound produced not by my fingers rapping on the desk, right? But it's a sound produced by the vocal cords, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> little boy, he starts to say, Professor's always clearing your throat. <clears> throat> when I clear my throat, do I intend to signify something by that sound that I make? No, so I can speak more clearly. Huh? <clears throat> but the name or the speech is a vocal sound that what? Signifies, right? Okay. I mentioned already the uh, definition of sign, right? Which is the one that goes back to Augustine, right? And I translate the definition as two parts. That which strikes the senses and brings to mind something other than itself. Huh? Now, <clears throat> the fourth part of the definition, huh? sound is the first part, right? Vocal is the second part. Signifying is the third part. Now, the fourth part of the definition, we say sometimes it signifies by custom or by agreement, huh? as opposed to by nature. Now, what are you separating the name or the speech from when you add by custom or by agreement? Things like moaning or yeah. sighing. There are certain vocal sounds that signify by nature, like a groan, right? So if you kick somebody in the stomach, or a groan, right? Mm -hmm. And you can recognize that groan around, right? If mm -hmm. someone attacks you in the dark, you scream or something, right? Or the baby's cry, right? The baby's cry signifies something. Uh, kind, of, kind of funny, you know. Uh, somebody gave me a little book on, on dads, you know. Huh? And one of my dad was was kind of funny, huh? The, the new father, right? The first time father. He's leaving the hospital, you know, with his wife and the new baby, right? And he wants, he's very concerned about doing the right thing. So he says to the nurse, you know, now, what would, would you wake the little fellow? <laughs> I realized that he's going to be taking over their life for a while. You know? and, uh, but notice, huh? it's by nature that the what, baby signifies, right? That uh, need, right, for food, and maybe need to have the diaper changed, and so on, uh, by crying, you know? Okay? That's when you first, you know when you first see the baby starting to look before and after? Okay. So I noticed when the baby would cry at night, the first thing we do is what? Change the diaper, right? Then the baby would get fed, right? Oh. Okay? And the baby would cry through the whole change of the diaper until they got their food, right? Uh -huh. But after a while, once they went to the changing table, they stopped crying. Oh, uh -huh. Like they knew that yeah, it's they going to be followed. Crying, yeah, yeah looking before and after will be followed by food. <laughs> And they tend to swallow their knees, right? <laughs> so they don't need to keep crying anymore, right? <laughs> um, okay. So those four parts are common to the definition of name and speech. Okay. But now the last part separates name from speech. No part of which signifies by itself. part of the definition. No part of which signifies by itself. But the last part of the definition of speech is having parts, and that means what, at least two parts, that signify by themselves.
So man, for example, huh, is the name, right? Man is a vocal sound. It signifies by custom, and you know what it signifies. And no part of man signifies anything by itself, right? Now, you can have parts in a name, like animal, right? Animal has three, what? Syllables, right? Mm -hmm. It's a vocal sound, right? Signifying by custom. It's not by nature. The Greeks would say zoan. <laughs> but no part signifies by itself. And in law. Does each syllable signify something? No, it's only the whole name that signifies something, right? Okay. And so the logician's analysis of language goes down to the name, but not below that. Huh? He's interested in vocal sounds only insofar as they, what, signify, right? But the grammarian will go all the way down to the letters and to the syllables, right? And the poet will go down to the letters because he wants to, what, rhyme and alliterate. And he's go down to the syllables because he wants Peter and so on, right? The magician doesn't care about that, right? This is the smallest thing for him. But speech uh, has parts, at least two that signify by themselves. So white man is the example of speech, right? Man means something by itself, and white means something by itself. And the whole, white man, right, depends upon the meaning of man and white. But the meaning of animal, though it has more syllables than white man, it doesn't depend upon the meaning of an and i and mal, right? Okay. And notice, huh, even if a name was put together, from two other names, right? If it's functioning as a name, its parts don't mean anything by themselves. So you call me Bergquist, right? And originally, we had a G in there, so we were called Bergquist. In fact, some of my uncles and aunts had the G in there. My father was Swedish and popped it out, and I got the full explanation why he did, right? But Berg in Swedish means what? Mountain, and Quist means branch, right? I'll say. But in my name today, Berkwist, if I had a G in there, would these two parts mean something? No. It's function as one name, right? I know a woman whose last name was Johnson, right? Well, she wasn't a son, and her father wasn't John, right? So Johnson is not, what, a speech, right? It's only the whole sound, right, that means. statement and syllogism or argument in general, um, definition is always a what? Speech. Okay. A statement is always what? Speech, right? It has parts that signify by themselves. Huh? So when I get the definition of square as an equilateral and right angle quadrilateral, well, quadrilateral means something, right? Equilateral means something, and right angle means something. And the meaning of the whole definition depends upon the meaning of those parts, right? When we define reason as the ability for large discourse, looking before and after, well, before had a lot of meaning, right? Looking has meaning, right, by itself, right? Discourse, large, each have meaning by themselves. Ability does, right? So a definition is never just one name. It's always a combination of two or more names. A statement now is a speech, right? Man runs. Man is an animal, right? Man means something by itself. Runs means something by itself, right? Okay? Man is an animal. Man means something by itself. Animal is that by itself. Man is not a stone. Man means something. Stone means something by themselves, right? And the meaning of the whole depends upon the meaning of the what? parts. Huh? The a fortiori an argument is going to be composed of two or more statements, right? Usually two statements. So it's going to be what? Speech, right? So we could say that uh, logic, in terms of its end, is about three acts of reason, right? But as a subject, it's about mainly the three speeches that perfect those three acts. Definition, which perfects understanding what a thing is. Statement, which is possible understanding the true or the false. And syllogism, or some other kind of argument, makes possible 
uh, reasoning, right? Okay. But when we examine these speeches, we'll see the names that they're put together from, right? Okay. And so we studied the names even before the what? definition, right? And before the statement. Okay. Yeah. I want to make sure I get that. So the subjects of logic are the tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And chiefly definition, statement, and so just to take the main kind of argument. It's pretty good. And, and you call name and speech two fundamental definitions. Definitions. Well, I mean, and two fundamental things we talk about, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So the work of of uh, of uh, Porphyry is sometimes called the book of the five names. And the categories is called the book of the ten names. And uh, actually in the Greek they'll say, you know, the, the five vocal sounds and the ten vocal sounds. Okay. So we're going to be studying then uh, uh, three main speeches. Huh? <laughs> we define this now. Let's look at this last text from Aristotle here, which is a little bit of a breakdown here. Of this idea of the third actor in page six now of things are magic. He says, All teaching and all learning by reason come to be from pre existent knowledge. Well, this ties in with what we saw about the word discourse, right? We define discourse in the definition of reason as coming to know, right? The unknown through the known, right? Okay. Aristotle is now looking at this in regard to reasoning in particular. This is clear to those looking at all. For the mathematical forms of reason now knowledge come about in this way in each of the other arts. Now he takes the mathematical forms of reason now knowledge, geometry and arithmetic, as the most clear examples of what? Demonstration, right? Okay. That's why you could use that phrase there, QED, all the time, right? Okay. But notice how in the beginning of Euclid, you can kind of see the three acts of reason because he begins with definitions, right? And then he gives certain statements that are obvious from the definitions, like the postulates and the axioms, huh? And then he starts to what? Demonstrate, right? And so he demonstrates to the postulates the first theorem, right? He uses the first theorem to demonstrate the second theorem, and so on, right? And in each of these, you're going from the known to the what? unknown, right? See? So he, he takes the parallels, he shows that when a straight line falls upon parallels, it makes what? The alternate angles what? Equal. Equal. These two are. These two first, right? Okay. Then later on, he's reasoning. I'm going to change the demonstration a little bit here. He does a couple of things, but if you wanted to show that the triangle has its interior angles equal to two right angles, you could use this and draw a straight line through there parallel to the base. Then, by this previous theorem, you'd know that these two were what? equal, but the alternate angles, and these two here would be equal. So these two equal to those two, and that's the third one, so you add up to two right angles. So having to know, right, in a very rigorous way, right, something you didn't know, and what you didn't know, right? Okay. How do you know these two angles are equal, right? We know already that when a straight line makes a straight line, it makes either two right angles or angles equal to two right angles. So, A plus X must equal two right angles, right? Because this is a straight line meeting a straight line, vice versa. And B plus X must also be what? Equal two right angles. Line is equal to the same or equal to each other. That's one of the axioms, right? They're equal to each other. And then equal is subtracted from equal, is another axiom. Equal, right? So you're reasoning to these angles being equal 
from this previous theorem, that was a straight line to straight line, I think it's two right angles, or angles equal to right angles. Yeah. And the quantities what equal to the same, equal to each other, and equal subtraction equals it's all the same yeah. right. Okay. So it's clear that he says in the mathematical forms of science at least, right? That you're knowing coming to know something to knowing something else, right? But in a very rigorous way that we call demonstration, right? <laughs> Now, when, when Plato talks about this kind of knowledge that's produced by demonstration, which in Greek is called episteme, right? He does so in the dialogue called the Theotetus, where Socrates talks with a mathematician about demonstration. Now, there's usually a connection between the guy that Socrates talks to and what he talks about. So he talks about courage with Laches, huh? Laches, who's an old, what, general. Presumably would know something about courage, right? He talks to Euthyphro about piety, because Euthyphro is prosecuting his own father for impiety, right? Mm -hmm. So he should know something about piety. Mm -hmm. But he talks to Theotetus, the you know, mathematician, about what? Demonstration, right? Okay. So Aristotle is talk, touching upon that first kind of reasoning that we talk about in the prior and posterior analytics, right? which is most easily seen in mathematics. Huh? Okay. And then he goes to the Socratic conversations, which are mainly dialectical. And likewise, in the conversations, and sometimes Socrates reasons by syllogisms, and then those by induction. Huh? For both teach through what was known before. These taking from what is understood, and that's something universal in the syllogism, and those, the ones by induction, showing the universal through the singular, that is clear. Huh? Said that conversation, yeah, the word dialogue, dialogue. means uh, Plato. The word dialogue is a Greek word for conversation, right? Okay. So, um, sometimes Socrates argues by a syllogism, right? He says, um, Sibius has argued that the um, soul is the harmony of the body, right? And Socrates says, well, the soul resists the body sometimes. Okay? And the always follow the body, right? The soul resists the body. But the harmony of the body does not resist the body. Okay. So if the soul resists the body, but the harmony of the body wouldn't resist the body, then the soul is not what? Harmony. Yeah. Now this is a syllogism, right? Okay. And the syllogism is defined as a a speech in which some statements laid down, another follows necessarily because of those laid down. Okay? So if you lay down these two, then it follows necessarily that um, the soul is not the harmony of the body. So sometimes Socrates syllogizes, and he doesn't read really say the definition fully, but he, deal, he will say this follows necessarily from that, right? So he has the general idea. But then Socrates wants to reason for the proposition that change is between contraries, right? And the first way we show this is by an induction. We say, what is it that dries out? The wet. Yeah. What is it that's moistened? The drought. Yeah, you can't moisten the, the ocean. And you moisten something that is dry. What is it that's hardened? Soft. What is it that's softened? Uh, yeah. What is it that becomes healthy? Sick. And who becomes sick? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he's showing, in many particulars, right, mm. something that he wants to what? say generally. Mm. The change is between opposites, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the other kind of argument called induction, right? And that's an argument from many particulars, right, to the general. Okay. 
But here you're starting from something more general, received by the syllogism. Where is that come from? This is from the Phaedo. Okay. Actually, it's three syllogisms there in the, the story of the position of the objection of Simeon, which is based upon suggestion about proof that the soul is the harmony of the body. He showed before there's a harmony of the soul, but there's not a harmony of harmony. Then hmm. more. Um, the other argument depends upon another argument you gave that the soul existed before the body, right? And the harmony doesn't exist before the body. Okay. But notice, huh? These syllogisms are not always what? Um, demonstrations, huh? Because maybe some of the premises are only what? Probable, right? Okay. But Socrates is given a probable argument. That the soul existed before the body. But the harmony of the body doesn't exist before the body, therefore the soul is not the harmony of the body. But maybe that statement is not even true, that the soul exists before the body. But it's probable, you know, Socrates didn't argue for it, right? So he syllogizes from that that the conclusion is not necessarily true because the one of the premises is not necessarily true, right? So Socrates will reason either by syllogisms or by induction. The reason why you do this in dialectic is that you're concerned with knowing something about the universal. And one way of knowing something about the universal is by an induction from the many particulars, right? The other is by syllogism. Now, in the same way, speakers persuade. Now he's thinking of rhetoric, right? The art of persuasion. For they do so either through examples, which is induction, and not simply induction, but it has a resemblance to induction. Or through enthymemes, which is, in a way, like a syllogism. Huh? Okay. And what way is example like an induction? Well, example here doesn't mean an, uh, a singular used to illustrate something. That's another meaning of example. But here example means an argument from one singular to another singular of the same kind. Okay. So, um, a friend comes to town, he wants to eat in a good restaurant in Boston, right? Years ago. So my wife and I had, had a wonderful meal at Joseph's restaurant. So let's go to Joseph's. Okay? I'm reasoning from the wonderful meal my wife and I had at Joseph's to what? The meal that he and I could have going to Joseph's, huh? So you buy a particular car and it lasts you a long time, so you buy another one of that same thing. It's going to necessarily be good? No, no, no. no. Is the meal going to necessarily be good? No, no. My wife and I went on Saturday night, and my friend and I went on Monday night, and probably not the same chef. <laughs> but the more the two are alike, the more you can reason from one to the other, right? Huh? MacArthur was defending the Inchon landing, you know, the chiefs of staffs were opposed to it and so on. And he compared what he was going to do to what Wolf's landing in Quebec, huh? No one thought Wolf could land where he did, right? Oh. But Wolf had stayed very closely and he could you know, climb up a bigger place, right? Yeah. And surprise the French, and that led to the mm. taking of French Quebec. Mm. The ending of the French Indian War, right? Mm. <laughs> so, um, now, notice, an, induct an example is a little bit like induction because in a sense I'm taking the last meal, the meal I had at, at Joseph's, right? As kind of what? Representative of meals at Joseph's, right? It's a very perfect induction. I had one or two meals there maybe, right? You see? So that's something of the induction, but not as the strength of the induction, which is from many, you know? So the scientist often bases himself upon an induction, but he's cut open hundreds or thousands of frogs, right? And they all have three chambered hearts or whatever they have, right? Is it? Well, I've eaten maybe this restaurant two or three times, you know? Or you know, only once. And what's an enthymeme, huh? An enthymeme is an argument from what? Likelihood or from science, huh? Boys will be boys, huh? Any exceptions to that? 
Huh? Yeah, sometimes you read the newspaper about a boy who did what you expect a man to do, right? Yeah. So, uh, likelihood falls short of the true universality of the syllogism, right? See, if, if I had a syllogism like this, huh? We say uh, no odd number is even, and every three is odd. There's an odd number. But to follow necessarily that no three is what even, yeah. You notice that complete university, uh, universality here, universal negative, right? No odd number is even. And for knowing what an odd number is, an even number, I can see that, right? Okay? But now if I say boys will be boys, he's only a boy, therefore he's going to act like a boy, right? Is it have the same verb? No, because sometimes a boy, you know, like the, the Dutch boy put his finger there and saved the dike, right? <laughs> sometimes a boy does something, right? Taking the mother and the father's away or something like that, right? We read about bits in the paper, right? Yeah. Um, it's difficult in human affairs, you see, to take propositions that are true what, universally, right? Return what you borrow, right? Cases you shouldn't do this, right? Okay. So there's some exceptions. So the nth mean will proceed from likelihood, but likelihood lacks the true universality of syllogism. So Aristotle says it's a syllogism in a qualified sense, right? It's like the syllogism, right? But it has a kind of universality, but not a complete universality. Or he argues in the nth mean from science, huh? Now, the most common sign that you have in, in uh, rhetoric is a sign that's more universal than signified. Huh? So if a man comes staggering out of a bar, what would you conclude? Drunk. Sign that he's drunk, right? But does everybody who staggers drunk? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have a physical defect, right? Uh, sometimes they are what? Just tired, right? Mm -hmm. You know? So we go down to the toilet, <coughs> almost to the sides of the walls, they go down to bed, right? You see? And um, uh, your eyes being bloodshot, you know? That sign you've been drinking? Huh? One time the state trooper stopped me, I was driving. I was driving about five miles over the speed limit, I was coming down from Quebec. And it's like an eight, nine hour drive, it's coming straight through, you know? At night time, you all the lights in your face. So he stopped me, he's giving a little warning and so on. But then, huh? Then he went away and looked back at me, you know, in my eyes. And he uh -oh. says, you were drinking? <laughs> and I said, no, I drove down from Quebec today. So I'll go to Dunkin' Donuts over here, get yourself some coffee. You know? <laughs> but the point is, you see, you must stop people who are going a little bit over the speed limit or a lot, right? And he recognized certain signs yeah. and been drinking, right? So, but my eyes were what? Something else, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I remember one time I had a student to come to class, he had kind of long, shaky hair, you know, and so on. And uh, so he uh, comes today one day in class and his hair is all cut real close and so on. And I said, I see get your hair cut. He says, yeah, I well, told him what happened, right? He got in some kind of an accident and he was defending himself and he came down to the courthouse to go to one of the offices and the cops saw him and said, you're in the drug charge tube over there. Uh -oh. <laughs> and so he said, I'm not going to go up here in court looking like a... A druggie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see, I mean, the, the point is, <clears throat> these, you know, we all recognize signs of certain things, right? You know? I was staying downtown in a street corner one time in Worcester, and I watched the watch the cop there, you know, kind of follow somebody on that thing. I said, what are you saying? I look closely and you see a little bulge here or something, you know? Oh. Like a gun or something, right? The way you pick those things up, huh? One of my wife's friends is married to a top policeman here in the city, detective, and, you know, he could pick out a prostitute, you know, two or three blocks down, you know, just by the way that they walk, you know, mm -hmm. see. 
But you can't always, these signs are not what? Universal, Universal right? So, an enthymeme is an argument from likelihood or from signs, but there are certain, what, exceptions, right? So it doesn't have the rigor of the syllogism, which requires true universality yeah, in, in the major premise. Now we'll be coming back to these forms of argument. Huh? I just thought I'd stick in that little text of Aristotle there. <clears throat> when we take up argument. Huh? But notice the emphasis in that text of Aristotle was on argument, right? Reasoning. Okay. Now in the text of the metaphysics, he's talking about the same thing, but he points out that this is true about what? Definition, right? Okay. It happens to the one learning geometry to foreknow, but he knows nothing before it that which there is reason out knowledge, and about which he's going to learn. But that through which he's going to learn, right? Contrary to Socrates, for all learning is through the foreknown. Either all, as Thomas explains, universal, or some, the particular. Both that by demonstration and that by definition. So, okay. I might mention apropos of this, huh? that when Albert the Great divides logic, he divides it not into three, but into what? Two. The art of defining and the art of reasoning. And the art of defining is about the simple unknown, he says, right? And how you come to know it. And the art of reasoning about the complex unknown. Okay? But then the consideration of the statement, he makes it part of the art of what? Argument, right? Okay? But Thomas divides it into what? Three. If you go back to the dialogue called the Nino, uh, it corresponds to Albert the Great's division. Because the Mino has three parts, huh? and the first part is about defining, the third part is about reasoning, the middle part is about what's common to the two, coming to know what you don't know. So in a way, um, Albert is closer to what? Plato's what? Division there, right? Huh? And uh, when Thomas is looking at the works of Aristotle, who's called the father of logic, and he sees they fall into these three, right? I'm sorry, I didn't follow how the, how the Mino in the division of three fits with Albert's division of three. Well, the Mino um, has two parts, or three parts. Huh? Right. And the first part begins with uh, Mino's question, can virtue be taught, right? And he's acquired some other way. And Socrates says, I don't know. Right. Furthermore, I don't even know what virtue is. Right. And so they get into a discussion of what virtue is. Socrates says, no, not anybody knows what virtue is. And Mino says, I know. <laughs> so they have a conversation, huh? and Mino has a hard time defining virtue. It doesn't really succeed, right? Okay. So that first part is a kind of introduction to the difficulty of defining huh? okay. Now, in the third part, huh, Mino comes back and he wants to know whether virtue can be taught still, even though he doesn't know what virtue is exactly. And Socrates says, well, we could discuss better whether virtue can be taught if we define virtue. But since you're not willing to do that, I'll try to talk about whether virtue can be taught, but I'm going to look at both sides. And he argues for and against. Mm -hmm. okay. Dialectically. Now, <clears throat> that third part was an introduction to reasoning. Mm -hmm. And Socrates distinguishes between knowing, in the sense of being certain, and opinion, right? Yeah. Even a true opinion, right? So he's making the distinction in a way between demonstration and dialectic, huh? Yeah. And so on. Okay. But the middle part of the dialogue begins with Socrates wants Mino to go with him and explain, uh, or try to find out, rather, what virtue is, right? And uh, Mino says, well, how can you investigate what you don't know? Yeah. You know? You don't know what you're looking for. Yeah. So I'm going to go looking for it. Yeah. So, and Socrates tries to reply to that, right? I don't think it's like troubles replying to it. Huh? So, how can you direct yourself to what you don't know? Uh, reasonable guess. Say, uh, 
because um, and if I tell you how do you, how do you get there, I go to the you know gasoline station. I say how do you get there? Where are you trying to get to go, buddy? Right? I can't tell you how to get there. I don't know where you're going. Yeah. So um, how can you direct yourself to what you don't know? That's really the problem yeah. of the middle part of the dialogue. See, but both in defining and in reasoning, you are directing yourself to what you don't know. And how is that possible, right? Mm. So the middle part is really about what's common to defining reasoning. And even the common interpreting, right? How can we direct ourselves to what we don't know? We don't know it. <laughs> so, and you see, logic is about, you know, using what you do know, right, to come to know what you don't know, right? Yeah. But how do you know what to use you know what you're trying to get to. See? And Aristotle, you know, alludes to the amino there in the beginning of the posture analytics, if you read it, huh? But Socrates gets into a difficulty. Mino's objections based upon, you know, statistical kind of argument, which you'll take up later on. And Socrates commits the very same kind of mistake when he tries to answer Mino. So Plato has artfully, right, separated <coughs> introduction to the art of defining and the art of reasoning by discussion of what's common to the two. Thing. So if you know Albert the Great's division of logic into defining and reasoning, right, and Austin used to use Austin's logic book years ago, but the name of the book was Logic and the subtitle was The Art of Defining and Reasoning. So it's following Albert the Great's division, right? But that goes back to, to Plato there in the, in the Socrates in the Mino, right? Okay. But Thomas, when he divides Aristotle's works, he divides them into what? Three, right? Okay. And I think there's something to be learned from both divisions, right? But in order to keep it into two, um, uh, Albert has to put the art about statements with the logic of reasoning, right? And doesn't see the other one, two, three there as well as Thomas does. <clears throat> but it's not impossible to divide what? The same thing into two and three, right? Like we're mentioning about the creed, right? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, the Nicene Creed and Apostles' Creed divides all the articles of faith into three. <clears throat> but the Athanasian Creed and the Creed of the uh, Fourth uh, Lateral Council divides all the articles of faith into two. The Nicene Creed divides it according to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they group all the, you know, articles around either the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, right? But the Athanasian Creed, so-called, and the Creed of the uh, Fourth Lateral Council, they divide it according to the humanity and the divinity of Christ. Huh? And they group them all Six articles of the humanity, six articles with the the divinity in it. Um, and both divisions make sense. Huh? But the, 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 the Nicene Creed emphasizes the, the Trinity, right? See. Well, when Peter makes his profession of faith, he's following the other division, isn't he? The earth, the Christ, the Son of the Living God. That's a complete profession of faith. <laughs> and and that's why the church is built upon that. Yeah. Aristotle divides the what? The plot into beginning, middle, and end. He divides it also into tying the knot and untying the knot. Both divisions make sense. Huh? Sometimes I divide the family into the parents and the children. learning is through the four known, right? Both that by demonstration and that by definition, right? Okay? The complex unknown statement, right? By demonstration. The simple unknown, the what it is or something, by definition. Okay? That kind of corresponds, right? So Albert the Great divides it according to the simple unknown and the complex unknown. And the 
one is answered by defining the other reason. Okay. <coughs> Just be a little bit before we do next time. We better get into it. So, we're going to find out Thomas' division there. We're going to talk about the art of definition, and then the art of the statement, and then the art of what? Arguments, right? Okay. So, this is the first part of the art of definition. Okay. You might have to make some copies of these, I think. Now, the, the first part of the art of definition is not about definition, but about what? Names, huh? Okay. Now, I begin with the question there, why names should be considered before definition? We should consider a name before definition, for we name things before we define them. Okay? Now, the reason for that goes back to the natural road we talked about. Huh? And one before and after there is that we know things in a confused way before, but distinctly. And so in order to name something, you don't have to know it as distinctly as you have to in order to what? define it. So for the most part, at least, we'll name things before we what? define them, yeah. Further, we use the name of the thing to be defined in the question which seeks its definition. As when Socrates asks, what is virtue? But one must understand the question before one tries to answer it. You see that? Right? And most of all, it's necessary to understand name before definition because every definition is composed of names. And a whole that is composed of parts cannot be understood without knowing its parts. That's true of every speech, huh? So Aristotle takes up noun and verb before he takes up statement, right? Because the statement is composed of the noun and the verb, huh? Okay? So these are three reasons why we should take up name before definition, huh? I mentioned how, how the book of Porphyry is sometimes called the book of the five names. And the categories that are styled the book of the ten names. And those are considered, in the tradition, the fundamental books huh? in, the, in logic. Okay? But they're about names. <laughs> okay? We should first consider what a name is and define it. Okay? And since the name of the thing to be defined should not be used in its definition, we must also distinguish between the name of the thing to be defined and the name is used in its definition. And since there are many names in the definition, we must also see what is the difference among these names and their order. Okay. So each of these, I, I broke the text a lot down with each of these titles and see what each one is doing, right? Okay. So we're starting the logic of the first act, right? The first act of reason is understanding what a thing is. The chief tool, right, for understanding what thing is, is definition, right? Okay? 
But the definition is a speech composed of names, right? So we have to talk about names before we talk about this, huh? Okay? And when we ask for a definition, we use a name, right? Okay, and we name a thing before we define it, right? There's all reasons to take up, okay? But we have to not only say what a name is, but we must also distinguish among names. Because is the name of the thing defined when the name is in the definition? Okay. Mm -hmm. In a way, you, you learned a rule in logic, right? When you said that the name of the thing being defined should not be put in its definition, huh? That's something we learned in grade school or high school, maybe, right? And that's, in a sense, a rule of logic, isn't it? So, so you have to talk about names we can talk about definition. Okay. You have to distinguish somehow between the name of the thing defined and the names used in the definition, but it's going to be more than one. There's going to be a distinction among those names. Huh? Okay. I've already given you the definition of a name there. A name is a vocal sound signifying by custom, no part of which signifies by itself. Huh? And then I explain each one of those parts, right? Starting with sound, huh? Focal, so on. Signifying by custom. You notice that four parts of the definition are common to the definition of name and speech. It's only the fifth part that separates the two, right? Okay. Then I contrast a bit the, the uh, grammarian and the poet and so on with the logician, right? Sometimes they call these the sermos and now the scientia. The sciences that talk about words, right? Speech, right? But the grammarian doesn't talk about words in the same way the logician does. And the poet looks at language differently too, huh? What's the difference between these, huh? What's the difference? Yeah. So he's concerned, you know, with the fact that the sounds are what? Pleasing, right? Huh? Okay. So he's going to try to rhyme things and alliterate things, right? And he's going to try to have meter, things of this sort, right? Okay. But he's also going to use, we'll see, things like metaphors that the magician will try to avoid, huh? Okay. But it's because his end or purpose is to make a pleasing representation that he uses all these things. Magician is not interested in making a pleasing reputation. He's trying to come to know what he doesn't know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The grammarian is, is concerned with what? Making a sentence in some language. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So how do you make a sentence in Greek? Make a sentence in Latin? I make a sentence in English, right? Mm -hmm. And he's concerned with, with all sentences, not just the, the statements, right? With commands and prayers and so on, right? The magician doesn't care about commands and prayers and uh, exhortations, right? Shut the door. Grammarian says, well, that's a command, right? The magician doesn't talk about those sort of things. Help me. Oh, <laughs> Mary would talk about that, not the magician. Okay. The grammarian doesn't care if the sentence is true or false. Yeah, we always contrast these, you know. If, if you say to the grammarian, which is better, man is a stone or men are an animal? <laughs> well, man is a stone is correct, right? Good grammar. Men are an animal. Incorrect, right? Socrates is a dog. Good. Socrates am a man. Socrates are a man. That's bad. Magician would say, well, Socrates am a man. Huh? 
<laughs> I feel like she's speaking radically, but 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 he but ain't a what stone, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's right the truth or falsity of these things, huh? and knowing whether they're true or false, huh? the Mary couldn't care less, right? As long as you see it properly, right? Yeah. Okay, so so that's things we we somewhat met, but you know, go over that, right? Okay, but now towards the bottom of page two there. I make the distinction there between calling a thing by its own name or the name of another thing. Okay. Now what is that distinction? No. No. If I call a man who eats too much a glutton, I'm calling him by his own name, right? If I call him a pig, I'm calling him by the name of another thing. Mm-hmm. Proper and metaphorical transfer. Yeah, yeah. If Romeo calls Juliet Juliet, right, he's calling her by her own name. If he calls her honey or sweet or something, he's calling her by the name of another thing, right? No. Carrot in the box. No, no. No, that's the example of a metaphor, right? Okay. But now, is there a reason why we call something by the name of another thing? Yeah, yeah. But is it more with regard to knowing that thing that we call it by the name of another thing? Or do we um, do so more to express our emotion, right? Or to arouse emotion, right? Right? Yeah, the the person who um, uh, yeah, if you want to arouse emotion or express emotion, you want to be you know uh, colorful in your speech, right? Then you might call something by the name of another thing. Nixon called the Democratic programs retreads of the New Deal. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a unsavory metaphor, right? You know, retread it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So you want to, you know, you know, arouse an image, right? But, but more so emotion, right? So, okay. But but Romeo calls Juliet sweet or honey more to what? Because it was only emotion, right? You know, see. Now, would the logician want to, uh, when he asks the definition of a thing, would he call the thing by its own name or by the name of another thing? Yeah, by its own name, right? Okay. So this seems to be an exhausted division, huh? Call something by its own name or by the name of another thing, right? Another question is, what names would you use in the definition? The Brahmanites. Well, if you call the thing by its own name, but you're not supposed to use the name of the thing you're defining in the definition, right? If you use the name of another thing, how is that going to help you to define? Yeah. But I mean, with, with the word pig, um, uh, be a name the definition of, of button? Oh, no, it, it has to be the genus of the thing. So, yeah, so you get, get, a, get a little bit ahead of this now, see? Oh, okay. see? No, so we made a distinction. We can call a thing by its own name or by the name of another thing, right? Okay? Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why we do both, right? Okay? What's well, more appropriate, you know, to the, the poet, right, or the rhetorician, or to people in daily life to call something by the name of another thing, right? Because they want to, the poet or the rhetorician or people in daily life, they want to express their emotions, right? They want to arouse emotion, right? Okay? So I say, you rat, you know, it's my pet, you know? And it, 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 it makes you kind of bristle. And so on, you snake, you know, <laughs> fox. And uh, these sort of names, right? Huh? 
Um, but the tradition wants to kind of avoid that, right? Huh? Okay. So it seems you have only two possibilities, to call a thing by its own name or by the name of another thing. So when you ask for the definition, we call the thing by its own name, right? That means it can't use its own name in its definition then, right? Mm -hmm. We can got to use the name of another thing in its definition, but that's useless for defining. The word pig doesn't really tell you what a glutton is, does it? Mm -hmm. So that's a little, I presented in the form of a little problem there, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. See? See? Maybe. Could you use the names of its parts? Perhaps, yeah. yeah. They're going to define a thing by its own name or by the name of another thing. Either, either alternative seems to be what? Well, One is the violation of the rule you learned in grade school, right? Uh -huh. There's a reason for that rule, right? If you define something by itself, and you aren't making anything known, are you? Mm -hmm. The purpose of the definition is to make known right. something that you don't yeah. know what it is. Huh? Right. So I say a dog is a dog, I don't make it known anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It's true that a dog is a dog, but it doesn't make it known any more than the word dog did, right? You say a dog is a dog, you're no more, no better off than you were you said dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you can't define it by the name of another thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really what a glutton is. A pig is not really a four-footed animal with a tail and a snout. Yeah. Okay. You have a problem there right in the beginning, right? Hmm? That is a very problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> what's the solution to that, right? <laughs> huh? It's not to page four we raise the problem there, right? The problem should be define a thing by its own name or by the name of another thing. And you have a dilemma there, right? And then you get the solution of the problem, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So you see? You, you, you see, it, you, it, with that problem, when you think about it a little bit, how you really got to think about names for a while before you can, what? Understand definition, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You finally get to, to the distinction of Porphyry. He distinguishes between the name of the thing being defined, the name that begins a definition, the name that completes a perfect definition, the name that completes an imperfect definition, and the name that's useless for naming the thing or for defining it. He distinguishes all five. Five names. <laughs> and of course, as he points out, these five distinction to five is useful not only for definition but for division and for demonstration. Porphyry's work, you know, was originally called the Isagoge, meaning introduction in Greek, the Isagoge to the uh, uh, categories of Aristotle, right? But as time went on, they just called the Isagoge by Tonomasia. It is the introduction. <laughs> It's an introduction to sense to logic, which is an introduction to the whole philosophy, huh? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's called the basic game. Okay. Then you get the next problem there on page five, right? Thank you. But that second problem arises because of the solution to the first problem. Yeah. The solution to the first problem leads you the difficulty. About the thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then you have the solution to that in page six, right? Okay. You're gradually sneaking up to what Porphy's going to talk about. Huh? You know, you get a hint. I got, I got a hint years ago from, from Thomas Aquinas there, because he uses Porphy's distinction of the five names in the Summa Theologiae uh, Contra Gentiles. Mm -hmm to show that no name is said univocally of God and creatures. So he pointed out something about Porphyry's division that's usually not pointed out, mm -hmm. not even by Porphyry. So mm -hmm. I incorporated it in here. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. 
Now, you know, one of the problems for the, for the uh, modern philosophers, and it's a very basic problem, is they don't, they don't know how to use names. They don't know how to use names. And, and the, you know, the Greeks really thought out how to use names in a way that helps the mind, right? And the moderns have just lost that. Like the very, you know, it's kind of, you know, democratic customs kind of uh, exacerbate this uh, problem of how to use names. Huh? You know, use names any way you want to. It's a free country, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a free country. You can't stop people from using names any way they want to. I mean, you can't stop them. But it's not really very helpful in the long run. You know? When you say they don't know how to use names, hmm. Example, using metaphors or well, basically, um, they don't know how we um, use names to define. They don't know how we uh, name things. Huh? How we carry over names, right? Like we've seen there with the, with the word before, right? Uh, Remember those propositions I was giving you before, saying that if a man doesn't uh, understand the names he uses, is he wise? Now, if he understands the names he uses, is he wise? No. I would say, understanding the names you use is before being wise in the second sense there of before, right? You can understand the names um, you're using without being wise, but you can't be wise without understanding the names you're using, right? Therefore I say, if you don't understand the names you're using, you're not wise. If you do, I don't say you are wise. Okay? It's before in that second sense. This can be without that, but not vice versa, right? And Aristotle, you know, begins the subject of wisdom there in five of, of the first philosophy. He has a whole book devoted to the names used in the science. I had this big couple at my house last night for one of the words there in book five, and I said to them, I said, you know, it gives them the same proposition, right? If you don't understand the words you're using, right, you're not wise. So book five is not going to make you wise, but if you don't know book five, you're, you're not wise. Uh, Kynick used to say uh, that every respectable word in philosophy is equivocal by reason. Huh? I just don't understand what a word equivocal by reason is. Which is why they have a little hint of it, you know. Like when Rudy Russell talks about systematic ambiguity. <laughs> you know? But they don't understand the various ways that we use words equivocally. Huh? They have reasons for doing it. No, it's just, this is too below them, you know? It's too below them to, to, to send to this kind of talking about the names they use. Right? I was listening to a guy give a talk based on his, his doctoral thesis on Heidegger, you know. And of course, the word they love to use is process or proceeding, right? So I said to him, you know, as far as I know, you know, um, something proceeds from something, right? So what are you saying is proceeding from what? <laughs> no response, right? Why are you using the word, right? <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't even understand the word whole and part, the modern so.
if you asked them on Flossa, what are the, the four basic meanings of the word part, they wouldn't be able to tell you. And they confuse the parts, the senses. I give them, the students sometimes a little sophisticated argument, I'll say. Uh, what is man, huh? He's an animal, right? Yeah, man's an animal. Was he just an animal? No. He's an animal with reason. Yeah, yeah. So animal is only a part of what man is, right? Yeah, okay. But animal includes besides man, dog, cat, horse, elephant, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the part sometimes is more than the whole. Gee whiz, yeah. <laughs> Well, this is the most common kind of mistake made in thinking, right? Mm -hmm. For mixing up two senses of the word, right? And Aristotle, in the chapter on uh, part and whole, right? The chapter on part in particular, he says that the genus is a part of the species in one sense, and the species is a part of the genus in another sense. And you're confusing the two senses, right? Mm -hmm. Animal is a part of the definition of man, right? But a man, horse, elephant, dog are not parts of the definition of animal. There are particular kinds, parts in the sense of particular kinds of, right? So you're confusing two different senses of whole and part there. And the definition of man contains more than animal. An animal is said of more than man. Two different senses of part there. But the average student, when you give it the entire system, can't. Seems like a good argument, right? Seems to call in question the axiom that the whole is more than the part. I've been cutting up bodies, the, the medical man says, huh? Adamus says, I never found a soul there. <laughs> you know, you find the lung and the heart and the you never found this thing you call the soul. Was well, the soul part of us in the way that the lungs and the brain and the heart and the liver are part of us? Huh? Since it's the soul part of us. It's a different sense. So Aristotle distinguishes all these senses, huh? And they don't know what you're saying in a sense, right? And once in a while, the moderns, they, they, they realize there's something to this, you know? And you can see that in, in the essay of Human Understanding by John Locke, huh? You know, where he says, you know, that I've noticed in conversation, you know, that men aren't really thinking about the same thing, although using the same word. <laughs> You know, see, but he doesn't really develop the doctrine, you see. You know, but he sees somehow, you know, this is really behind a lot of this mm -hmm. confusion, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. But it takes a long time, you know, to 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 uh, to uh, understand these words that are equivocal by reason. Mm -hmm. And the care that Aristotle did those, mm -hmm. or even the care, you know. Thomas learned it from Aristotle, you know, but mm -hmm. I think I mentioned how the word in, you know. Aristotle, we don't have an explicit text where Aristotle orders the meanings of in. But Thomas says we'll order them in the way that Aristotle taught us in the fifth book of metaphysics. He orders them from what? In the room, right? Part in the whole, right? Genus in the species. Species in the genus. Uh, form and matter. The whole in the parts. I've got you in my power. Left my heart in San Francisco. It was perfectly right, you know. But uh, you never find life in the moderns, you know. You know in, in a sense, uh, what does Shakespeare, you know, compares to proud man, you know, he climbs to the heights on a ladder, right? He, disdains to look down from where he started, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, in other words, to say that, that uh, you don't have to distinguish and see the order of the senses of these words is equivocal by reason that dominate our whole speech. It's kind of like a pride in a sense, right? You know. You know? I mean, God, the angels don't have to do this, right? 
just man has to do this, huh? Now, it goes back to the fact that we're so tied to our senses, huh? And and the most the most common mistake in thinking is what? Due to mixing up the senses of word. It's the most common mistake. I asked my students, you know, uh, uh, we discussed the question of the nature acts for an end, right? For a purpose. And arguments for or against and one student in his paper is saying, you know, if nature acted for an end, all things would come to an end, but they haven't therefore. <laughs> but he's obviously confusing end in the sense of destruction of the thing, right? Within the sense of purpose to have the sake of which, right? Well, the first one is more the quantitative sense of part, right? And then, um, these are distinguished that, because that's the most known uh, composed whole, right? With the, what they call the universal whole, right? Okay. And, you know, later on, we'll do this in logic. The composed whole is put together from its parts, right? But not set of its parts. And the universal whole is set of its parts, but not put together from them. Okay. But the first meaning of whole in part is the composed whole. So we might say that the, the word cat is composed of C, A, and T, right? Okay. And uh, we might say, if the chemists are right, that water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, right? Okay. The family is composed of the mother and the father and the children, right? Okay. But then the universal whole is set of its parts, huh? Like uh, number is set of odd number and even number, right? Or parts of number, right? Okay. So you're talking about the general and the particular, but the word particular is taken from the word part. Right? It's a different sense of part, huh? So number is not put together from odd and even number. But number is said of odd and even, right? Okay. An animal is not put together from dog, cat, and horse, but it's said of them, right? Otherwise, to say a dog is an animal, you say that a dog is composed of cat, dog, horse, and elephant, right? Okay. Now, you know, if you look, you know, going back to my, our friend there, John Locke, he's talking about the general idea of triangle. He says that it's scaling, isosceles, equilateral. He says, what's well, all none of these? He's looking at the universal whole as if it were composed of the what? Things that it's set up. He's confusing the what? Composed whole with the what? Universal whole. Okay. But then Aristotle goes on to distinguish two other kinds of what? Of composed whole. And one, of course, is the definition. Okay. And the other is the composition of what? Matter and form. Huh? Okay. Now, um, take a very simple example of that. Huh? If you had the word cat here on the board, I don't know, I just show it. If you had the word cat here, what are the parts of the word cat? Let's see. Yeah. And that might seem to be the only parts of the word cat, right? Because you take away the C and the A and the T, nothing's left, right? So there's nothing in the word cat except C, A, and T, right? Okay. But then, when you look at the word act, same word? Not exactly the same letters, right? Mm -hmm. Same word, right? Same letter, right? Same word? Okay. But there's something in the word cat besides the letters, isn't there? So you might say that the word cat is put together from the letters and the order of the letters. Okay? And the word act is put together from the same letters but a different order. 
So you can speak of the letters and the order as the parts of the word cat. Okay? But you obviously use the word part in different sense than you start off with. Okay? You wouldn't think of the order of the letters as being a part of the word, would you? At first. Would you? And yet it's intrinsic to the thing, and that's what you mean by a part of the way, right? You wouldn't have the word cat without that order, would you? So the way um, the word cat involves the letters and the order of the letters, right? The rubber ball involves what? But the parts of a ball. Rubber and the other shape, right? Those are in a sense parts, but it's not parts of the way in which C, A, and T are parts. Okay? That's a different sense. So what Aristotle does is distinguish three senses of composed whole. The first one is kind of the quantitative one, right? And then the one of matter and form, or in the broad sense to include on the shape of order, right? And then um, the parts of the definition. Or different senses of part. In the fifth book of the Metaphysics, he talks about all the words that are mainly used in the wisdom because of its generality, but they're used in the axioms, right? And used to some extent everywhere. Um, okay, so, so basically, there's the two parts composed and universal, but then composed has three parts. Three senses, yeah. Three senses. Yeah. The quantitative one is the one that's most known to us, right? Yeah, and then quantitative, oh, okay, yeah, so like um, yeah. all the parts of the body make up the body. Yeah. 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 Notice why it's more known to us. So you could you could divide up the body, put the liver here and the heart here and the lungs here, right? Uh -huh. You know, so they had to take the word cat and put the, cut it up, you know, put the C here and the A here and the T. Uh -huh. But you can't put the, the letters here and the order of the letters here. So it's less manifest to us that these are distinct. When you compare cat and act, or dog and god, eh, then you realize there's something in the word cat besides the three letters. What is that? In this case, it's the order, right? Okay. The letters, like the yeah. matter and the form. A form in general. The form is used not just for shape, right? But for the act, the order. The order. And, uh, the parts. parts of the definition, uh, the, the distinction, then, that would be third in, in the order of senses. Um, it's a little bit less, less uh, yeah, it would be less known to us. But two, two of these uh, senses of part are found in the real world, outside the mind, right? Yeah. Quantitative parts and yeah. matter and form. Right. But the parts of definition are more in the mind, and the general in particular, right? The universal is only in the mind. Uh, what what, what Boethius was saying, a thing is singular in sense, the universal and understood. So when you divide the general in the particular, you're talking about of universal, that's in the mind, the things are universal. And the parts of the definition are universal. What's defined as universal. However, the great says the first thing to be considered in logic is universal. Yeah. I'm going to make that a little more sensible and say that the first thing to be considered in logic is, is named set of many things. And you'll see us might be meant to that here in the first reading, you know, named set of many things. Um, so that, uh, but the name of what is defined is a name set of many things, and the names of the definition are names set of many things. But so something's universal only in the mind, see? So two of those senses, parts of the definition, and then the, you know, the general, the particular, the genus and the species, is divided into. That's in the mind, too. Although 
has a foundation in things. Huh? But the foundation in things for those ones in the mind is matter and form, basically. We'll see that as we get on, because the, the genus is the difference is like matter is to form, as Paul said. The, the universal, that's a sense of um, as, uh, how we could speak of like dog, cat, man as parts of animal that would be a universal thing. Yeah, but we notice all of these are said of many things, so they're all universal, right? Man, dog, horse. But animal is more general than they are, more universal. 